Welcome everybody to the first webinar on hybrid energy networks, Austria goes international. So we have a couple of Austrian presentations from Austria, but also international uh, input here in our webinar. The webinar is separated into, into two blocks to make it a bit more pleasant to participate. We have the first block now. This webinar is held in the framework of the International Cooperation Program, IEA DHC Annex TS3 Hybrid Energy Networks. That's a lot of operations. I will explain you a bit more what this is later. I am the operating agent, so the leader of that international cooperation program. My name is Ralf Roman Schmidt. I am from AIT Austria. That is the largest non-university research organization. Uh, in Austria. Um, um, yeah, you can find more information on the Annex with using that link below, but uh, we will also uh, send information. I will also give some information in the in the later stage on that uh, on that cooperation program. Uh, we have a lot of things to discuss today, a lot of presentations, a lot of exciting talks and some interactive elements at the very end. so i'm I'm very excited for that uh, um, webinar. First of all, I would like to let you know, and you might have heard that already, this webinar is recorded. Um, we will put the video file on YouTube, so that will be available worldwide and hopefully forever. Uh, and we will distribute the link to YouTube and together with the presentation slides after the webinar, maybe not tomorrow, but I would guess within the next week, you will be able to send the, the information. Also, I would like to advise or already prepare you. We will have a group photo at the end of each block. So please be prepared to turn on your webcam. Obviously, you can do if you want to turn on your webcam, if you're fine with having your face then recorded and be available on YouTube to everybody and everywhere. Uh, that's, that's good. If you don't want to, I totally understand this, but it's, it's nice to have a bit of a picture who's, who's in, who has been in the room and who were listening to see a bit the the faces to the names and, and not only a, a list of uh, uh, names here. Uh, second part, uh, just a very short introduction to go to meeting very briefly. Um, you might have, you might see, or you, I'm pretty sure for those who are with the uh, on computer online, you see the panel for go to meeting. You can hear mute yourself. Um, you can turn off and turn on your webcam and here below, you have a chat window where you can, um, if there are some requests, you can put in uh, the request in the chat window um, and make some notes. I don't, uh, I have a colleague with me that is monitoring the chat. Um, uh, that's Edmund Wiedel. So if there's any points, yeah, he will, uh, he can, he's able to mm -hmm. unmute you. Uh, uh, please unmute yourself as much as possible. I will do this uh, mm -hmm. for, Everybody is as soon as you are, it's a soft mute, so you can unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself. If not, please, please make a note in the chat so we can, we can um, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question for the presentation, for example. Also important for the um, panel at the top right part, there's a small double arrow. You can minimize the panel that makes it a bit more easy to, 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 to watch the um, presentations. Yeah, I am very happy that so many people are, are coming here. Uh, and it's uh, for this big round, it is uh, some, some rules for the game, some etiquette. Uh, so as I said, the microphone should be muted. Uh, only switch on if you're speaking. Um, if you have a request to speak, you can report this in the chat. Either you type in RTS for request to speak, or you just put in the question you have directly, then we can read the question out for you as well, for, for the presenters. Um, yeah, please turn off your webcam as long as you are don't as long as you are not either a speaker or as we don't make the group photo. And caution with humor and sarcasm, that's difficult to understand sometimes on a on an audio, audio format. Um, yeah, just give you some some insight what we're doing today. Uh, we are going to yeah, now introduce the webinar and I will soon go to the International Cooperation Program of the IEA DC Annex T3, explain a bit about this. And then we have uh, five presentations um, uh, on, on various aspects of hybrid energy networks. You see them here on the screen. I don't want to go to them now in detail. We're going to work all of them. I hope we're going to be finished at 11.30. 
uh, then some good lunch break and at um, one actually it continues actually at 12 30 we will be already online if you for those who are rejoining they um, can come obviously at one but there are people that's arriving newly so we have again at 12 30 the possibility for already joining in early and we have four other presentations in the afternoon and um, a finalizing presentation for myself where we did a SWOT assessment, so an assessment of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of district heating and cooling networks within an integrated energy system. And we have some interactive element. There will be an online voting and some open discussion around as, as much as this is possible. Uh, we have about six, 76 attendees at the moment. Let's see how much interactivity we can get with so many people. Uh, uh, unfortunately, not everybody will be able to speak uh, um, due to this high amount of, of people. Um, yeah, what else to say? I guess we're going to go already to the first presentation. Yes, that's the um, introduction into the uh, Annex TS3. Uh, first of all, for those who don't know, um, this uh, the Annex uh, so uh, the IA um, TCP Technology Cooperation Program on District Heating and Cooling is an international platform for experts. It's um, a program helping to help district heating and cooling, but also combined heat and power, a, a powerful tools for energy conversation and reduction of environmental impact of supplying heating and cooling, obviously as well. It's a corporation. This platform has a couple of members. You can you can see them here listed on, on the screen. Uh, a lot of these member states are today participating. I, I had a look in the participant list. It's, it's a really international webinar. I'm, I'm really glad to, to have so many people here. Um, there are two ways to do projects within these uh, cooperation program, either via a cost sharing approach. So the IEA DHC TCP has a common fund. So member states pay member fees and these member fees are put into a, a fund that will be sub, that will be made available for researchers to do research projects with this money. Uh, the there will be there's an open call for projects uh, every three years. The last one just has finished, so we are in the middle of the uh, in, um, process for evaluation and and submission. Unfortunately, it's not anymore possible to put in new proposals for the current cost sharing. Uh, for projects, but within the next two years, in two years we will have a, a new call, or two or three years we will have a new call open. So then a, another possibility to participate from the cost sharing point of view to get money from the IA DHCTCP. And the second possibility for participating is task sharing. That means it can participants contribute resources in kind and connect existing national and international projects. And the Annex Tier 3 is. Uh, is such a project where, where all participants, and there's about 20 participants in the Annex G3, we are all contributing our own resources, own money. Some have national funding opportunities for these kind of participation. And we are putting together a lot of things based on the national national um, national work we are doing, but, but also Horizon 2020 projects and so on. Um, very briefly to the background of the Annex T3 as such. Um, this is uh, the, the, the basic idea here is to look at the integration of the electricity, gas, grids, heating, cooling networks um, as one of the key measures for decarbonization of the energy systems. It's also known as sector coupling, and now the European Commission calls it smart sector integration. There's actually just like yesterday, uh, the Commission opened a public consultation on their um, a smart sector integration strategy. So it's a hot topic uh, on the Commission side. They really want to go a step further on, on this topic, want to put money into it, want to fund projects in this area. So it's a, it's a hot topic on the Commission side. Now, why is this? Obviously, it, hybrid energy networks or integrated energy systems are triggering important synergies that couldn't be realized if you're only optimizing the heating or the electricity or the gas uh, infrastructures individually. However, at the, uh, at the other side, there are several challenges such as competition, 
complexity uh, that has to be tackled when we're going to these uh, integrated energy systems. Um, and I would like to give you, I have been very often asked, what is a hybrid energy networks? What is it? And, and I, I'll just list here a couple of examples, what, what, what come into my mind, what is kind of the idea behind it. The basic idea is that one of the five named coupling points on the right side, so CHPs, power to heat uh, processes like heat pumps, electric boilers, but also power to gas processes are used to couple these energy systems. Um, and, and you see, I don't want to read all of them, to go to all of them in, in detail. You will get the slides on a later stage. And these are only examples what I personally understand as a hybrid energy network. To make it a bit more clear, we discussed, uh, this is not a final one, we discussed the definition, what is a hybrid energy network, and this is a draft definition. We actually will come to that definition back later uh, in the second block, we will have some discussion, a bit more discussion here on the definition. I just want to already give you an introduction here. Um, so we are, uh, for, for understanding a hybrid energy network uh, and the level of this energy system or the degree of energy system integration, uh, how, how much, if, if it's a very simple hybrid energy network or very much uh, complex hybrid energy network, we are, uh, the idea is here to define three different layers. To, to differentiate the uh, way how it is integrated, starting from a technological layer, where a minimum integration, a minimum coupling would be just like one coupling point, a big, big one, or maybe also very, very small one. If you go to a maximum system integration for, from the technological point of view, you will see many different coupling points, um, each of them able to deliver high shares of heat supply. You will have advanced controls, not only of the heating, but also of the electricity. Um, side or maybe even gas systems, uh, you will see um, uh, forecasting electric of electric prices of heat demand of of a lot of different things. The second layer, the strategic layer, how much integrate, how much renewables are integrated, waste heat, uh, how much you follow a certain strategy like a decommunization strategy in order to do these kind of integration. If you go for minimum system integration, you do these integration on centrally, you organize everything uh, um, on a central level, the, and you do the integration of coupling points basically as a reaction on, on short-term market pressure. You're not, you're, react, you're, not, you're more reacting than uh, acting. If you go for a maximum uh, uh, level of system integration on the strategic layer, you will see a lot of decentralized, more decentralized structures to integrate decentralized renewables, you have forward-looking integration of and, and planning of the energy system, and you really optimize interaction with the different networks. And also very important, you're really looking to a decommunization scenario and not act proactively going towards the decommunization and not uh, reacting on, on a market pressure. Um, from the organizational layer, that's the third one. We also looking at, at this uh, minimum integration would be the minimum allowed or permissible ownership of coupling points. In, in, your, in many regions in the world, you have unbundling. That means you cannot operate the, uh, this, the, the um, uh, and you cannot sell the energy and operate the distribution or transmission networks in one, in one, in one entity. So this is obviously separated. It's a minimum um, organization layer. And also you will have um, uh, traditional business models in this, uh, in this layer. If you go for maximum system integration uh, on the organizational point of view, you will have more uh, spread ownership of network assets and coupling points, high share of prosumers, innovative business models, new services offers, and so on. Again, we will come to that definition a bit later. Just This is just to give you a bit the framework, what I understand as a hybrid energy network and what are the, the different um, uh, levels of system integration within the energy network. I, I'm not actually saying that the, we necessarily need to go to a maximum level of system integration, nor we need to go to a minimum. I, I think in my personal point of view, uh, this is very local, depends on many, many different conditions on the local side. You might have things that work with a minimum level of system integration very well, but in other situations, you might need a maximum level of system integration. So continuing 
with the presentation, the, 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 the aim now of the Annex Tier 3 is to promote the opportunities and overcome the challenges of distributing networks and integrated energy systems. So we will look on a holistic level of all these aspects I just mentioned, and not only on the technical aspects, but also on the non-technical, strategic, and organizational aspects. The Annex is separated into uh, five subtasks. Um, going from technological details to tools, methodologies, to case studies and, and uh, non-technical issues like the framework, business models, and so on. We have dedicated subtask leader, you see the organizations mentioned here. Um, the schedule is, uh, we are, we, the, the, different, the annex started with some definition and preparation phase. Now we are in the middle of the working phase where we actually do work. We had already a couple of workshops in the past. We will have three other workshops in the future. Hopefully, we will have them physically. It makes it much more fun to talk to people physically. On the other hand, we see the advantage that we have now about 85 participants here that might be more difficult to reach in a, in a physical meeting and that not all of you are able to come. The Annex should bring a couple of results. Uh, all of them are listed here that are underway. Oh, that is, uh, as I said, we are in the middle of the work. We, a lot of things have been started. We are not, uh, we don't have any, we don't have um, many things finished now, but I expect in the next uh, year, uh, one and a half years, to see a lot of these things that are listed here upcoming. Um, the SWOT assessment, it's, it's a, the very first point mentioned here, we will present today in the second block a little more in detail. Uh, and today you will also see presentations from participants from the Annex um, that uh, from the Annex internationally, but also from the Austrian, but mainly from the Austrian participants in the Annex. Yes, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is everything for the Annex TS3. Um, we are a bit late in time already since due to the technical issues at the very beginning. But if there are very short questions, very brief questions to the Annex Tier 3, so either please add with window and uh, just ask freely into the room. Hopefully, it is possible. Oh, can you hear me? There's someone chatting that is, I'm not. Can you hear me again? I think I was better someone now, yeah. said I, he can, I can hear you. Now you can hear me again. Very good. Okay, so I have issues with my headphone, obviously. I'm I'm now doing without headphone. So I don't know where, where the presentation stopped, but I just want to ask uh, if there's any questions. Uh now you can put them in the chat window or you can just uh yeah, express them briefly. Uh, directly unmute yourself and, uh, and ask them directly. Yeah, but this seems to be not the case. Annex T3 is clear. So, so we're now coming then directly to the next one. Uh, that is uh, Christian uh, Dorschekal from Gissing Energy Technologies. He will give you a bit of introduction towards the next, uh, the fourth and fifth generation of district heating. Uh, trying to give, show you some trends and examples. Christian, are you, can you unmute yourself or I need to do this? Yes, good morning. And you can also open okay. my camera if you would like to. Then you can also see me. Yeah, you can do that. I hope so. Yes, no. I think it's not working. But otherwise, we can start, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Good morning from my side. My name is Christian Dotschekar. And at the beginning of the webinar, I would like to maybe give you a little bit of a critical view on the topic and also to activate you at the beginning of the webinar. So next slide, please. 
So the first question for me is, is there a need to transform the third generation of district heating into the fourth generation of district heating? From my point of view, it is not, not possible in most of the cases due to the temperature levels of the customers and also of the diameters of the heating grid. But I also think that it's important to reach uh, sub goals into that direction of the fourth generation district heating grid. I think there is still a lot of homework to do at the third generation. Um, for example, to lower the heating losses and also to optimize the operation. Next slide, please. So how can we reduce the return flow temperatures? I think it's important to think different in that uh, way. Um, like also Tom Tickett from Denmark did. Um, he wrote an article and here you can see the subtitles of the article. And here you can imagine how they think. They think more customer orientated. And I also think it's, it might be a key also for us uh, to think more customer orientated to get into the right direction. Was geht's? Ich bin im Webinar. Na, ja, ich bin im Webinar gerade. Also, ich, wenn dann schnell. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so, as yeah. I said, we have still a lot to do. So, as you can see here at the small district heating grid, uh, yeah. there are annual heat losses of about 41%. Uh, and in summertime, they are up to 82%. So, I think there is still a lot to do to optimize that system. Next slide, please. That you can also see here at the district heating pump, where this, heat, this district heating pump is operated most of the time at minimum flow. So at 3.7% efficiency to 10%. So there, as I said, we have to do our homework now. Next slide, please. So our grid temperature levels from about five to 25 degrees Celsius, the solutions. So this might be some energy uh, grids. So from my point of view, there it might be a solution, but only for several projects. So it might not be a solution for everything. Next slide, please. Because I would like to show you an example on that. It's in Austria, it's in, in Baden. They, they had some uh, research projects on energy grids uh, where they would like to use the waste heat from their coolers they are operating from a dairy uh, to use for heating and cooling uh, for a former military barrack. So they are using unisolated plastic pipes with a diameter of about 160 millimeters. And as you can also see the temperature level in, in winter time, it's nearly the same like the Earth's temperature. But in summertime, you can see the temperature level of the cold pipe is much colder than the Earth's temperature uh, around. The 25 degrees might, uh, should be at the right side. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so they also said it's important to have savings for the waste heat producer. So they get the savings uh, from electricity. They are saving there from not operating or no need to operate their 100 coolers there. Um, and they also calculated their heating losses with about 1% per year and a heat density of about three megawatt hours per meter and per year. So I think it's important also to get more um, into the seasonal underground storage to have a more effort on that because uh, this is quite important uh, for such an energy uh, grid and also to integrate also other heat sources like you can see uh, PV and so on. So I think that's quite important. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons they have learned? They said, okay, they need some also some financial benefits for the waste heat supplier that they are interested in uh, connecting. 
Um, and they, it is also important for them that you are not interrupting their uh, industrial process. So you need to take care and lower the risk on that. Um, they also said that it's easier getting waste heat from cooling systems than from wastewater because of the lower uh, effort on the operating costs. Um, it is also important that free cooling is not free of charge because they said, okay, we need to operate our grid and that's why we need to spend or we also need to get some income out of that. And the, the last point is that the energy grids are quite uh, investment intensive. So it is quite important there, uh, the rate of return on capital. Uh, so this uh, is a great influence on the heat generation costs. So the need to minimize them, the investment costs. So they are using uninsulated plastic pipes and also savings uh, for the redundant heat source, also for the backup system. So they're only uh, making the connections and not installing all of that. Next slide, please. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope to give you a good introduction uh, for the webinar and also some critical views and wish you a nice rest of the webinar. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Christian, for, for that introduction. Uh, I think it brings, uh, puts a big point here, hybridization, especially when you want to use heat pumps uh, efficiently. Uh, we need lower temperatures. People, a lot of people forget, forget this. And, and yeah, as you point out, energy networks is a very good, good point here. Is there any uh, questions from the audience to Christian? Um, if so, again, please either put it in the chat window or put it uh, directly, unmute yourself. I'm actually sorry for, for taking, for, for um, not unmuting myself. Um, as soon as I don't have my earphones in, I was not expecting to be able to be here. But anyways, that's working now. Obviously, there's no other questions. No one is putting something in the chat window. So then we can continue with the next presentation. That is Boris Klemann from E.ON. Um, he will talk a bit on the challenges of hybrid energy networks or for hybrid energy networks and the solutions they developed in the past that they have implemented. Um, from the industry perspective, uh, very good to, to have not only the academic side, but also the industry side. I'm just looking if I can already find him. He's on the telephone. Boris, are you with us? Absolutely. Hi, Ralf. Can I be heard? Perfect. Yes, I can Perfect. hear you. Wonderful. Great, great. Whilst well, you set up the slide, probably a quick um, thank you from my side. Thank you very much that I can be here and uh, present our solution, uh, which is very much in line uh, to what Christian just presented. Um, um, I'm Boris Klemann. Uh, I work for E.ON, as Ralf said, uh, in the City Energy uh, Solutions Department, uh, which is basically our district heating uh, and cooling segment. Um, and by means of uh, this presentation, I would like to give you a short insight into our ideas on uh, smart sector integration in hybrid district heating networks, um, i.e. Uh, low X and uh, energy networks. Uh, next slide, please. I think we can uh, all agree that one of the main industry challenges that we face uh, at the moment, uh, apart from Corona, <laughs> is the uh, challenge of decarbonization itself. Um, whilst for a long time energy sectors uh, have set up their own decarbonization agendas, uh, pretty much in separate to one another, and the focus was mainly on power rather, rather than uh, or not so much on the biggest energy sector uh, with the highest CO2 reduction potential heating, we now have a different situation. Uh, we now think much more into integrated solutions. I've already mentioned uh, the sector integration uh, strategy and regulation of the European uh, Commission coming forward. And we need these kind of thoughts uh, to speed up the process of decarbonization. We see a key role for flexible, low temperature heating and cooling solution, solutions here at E.ON. And it becomes a little bit clearer when we now look at the full picture of heating sources and connected energy sectors 
uh, both today and uh, which we um, think we will have in the future. In heating terms, uh, oil, coal and direct electricity heating become more and more obsolete. Um, natural gas-based solutions are good technologies for the transition phase, uh, of course, as we will all agree, um, and will certainly stay in the market for a bit longer than the other solutions, but will also de decline as decarbonization gains momentum. The open question is, when will hydrogen and other synthetic uh, renewable gases kick, uh, kick in? That's a little bit the elephant in the room. Until we have solved this, uh, there's of course uh, biomass and waste that, become, that might become more prominent, especially in district uh, heating, so on city level. But this always requires inner city combustion processes and uh, in the market we sometimes see how they get under uh, review as well. The highest effectiveness in technology terms we see, however, decentrally in heat pumps and centrally, especially in uh, dense areas, in district heating grid. So the resulting question for us is how can we combine the strength of heat pumps and, and the strength of district heating grids as a basis to accelerate decarbonization? Next slide, please. Our answer to that uh, is our ambient temperature network solution, ActoGrid, and I agree with Christian um, that these kind of solutions are not one size fits all solutions, but really interesting in uh, use cases where they uh, can be applied also in sector coupling and decarbonization terms. ActoGrid, um, so our solution operates on flexible temperatures, uh, roughly between zero and 40 degrees, so we, um, most of the time use water as a transmission medium in a two-pipe solution, i.e. supplying heating and cooling from one infrastructure. The two pipes are then connected by a balancing unit, a large-scale uh, thermal storage that can be borehole, that can be above ground as well, uh, that can also be a geothermal field um, activated in that sense. The generation is radically decentralized and taken care of by heat pumps uh, in all buildings of that particular district. Um, ActoGrid has a couple of advantages, very much in line to uh, all ambient temperature networks in efficiency and flexibility. The ambient temperatures radically reduce distribution heat losses, as we have seen by means of Christian's presentation. The two-pipe system also for us reduces installation costs, of course, uh, compared to a four-pipe system. The low system temperature enable us to in integrate uh, renewables and excess heat sources feeding in at low temperatures uh, such as uh, geothermal, solar thermal, wastewater heat, mining water heat, uh, we all know the range, and also um, a low degree industrial waste heat. Moreover, uh, the system allows for balancing effects between heating and cooling needs, and that is really key. Um, for instance, the excess heat produced by the generation of cooling um, e.g. for a data center in the district uh, is being put into the network and can then in turn uh, be used to optimize the COP of the heat pumps in buildings where at that point in time heating is needed in turn. Uh, finally, the flexible system temperatures themselves and also the storage capacity that, uh, that I outlined allow, uh, uh, low, um, uh, allow uh, local balancing towards the power grid and this is key for our question here. Next slide, please. A good example uh, for our activities and ideas in this area might be the funding project CLU that is coordinated by, by the Austrian Institute of Technology. Uh, the project develops local balancing solution in demo sites in Austria, Sweden, Scotland, and Germany. Um, in the German demo, uh, which we are conducting together with Fraunhofer, the local district heating company Stadtwerke Herne, uh, and uh, real estate developer Fakt AG, we are using uh, the ActoGrid technology as a sector integration solution. What does that mean? Um, um, we are applying this in Shamrock Park, um, mixed uh, use district, including greenfield and brownfield developments, uh, i.e. new buildings with low temperature needs and a building stock with higher temperature needs. That calls for a hybrid solution. Point of departure for Clue is the German exit from nuclear energy, uh, as you might know, until 2022, and the subsequent exit from coal until 2038. With these moves, the power base load will, of course, become more and more fluctuating, more and more dependent on intermittent renewable sources, uh, which will in turn uh, raise the needs for local balancing and flexibility in the power distribution grid. 
We believe that city quarters and local energy communities can really play a key role in stabilizing the power grid. And our vision is um, in the that ActoGrid in the future can, can play that kind of role. With its uh, large thermal um, storage capacities and its heat pumps as sector coupling elements, as um, Ralph outlined, uh, we can set up ActoGrid a bit like a big battery to export especially negative balancing um, energy. Uh, I'll uh, go a little bit into detail um, in a sec. With its large thermal storage capacities, of course, um, um, this uh, can be done quite flexibly. And um, in Shamrock Park, as we have the, the building stock element as well, we also plan CHPs to cover the higher uh, temperatures. So we also have a capability uh, to use power exports to the distribution grid. Um, as ActoGrid anyhow needs those thermal storage capacities um, for internal optimization, so thermal optimization of the system, the hope is that we have technology at our hand that allows um, uh, for, uh, to provide flexibility at marginal cost zero, so at very low additional uh, um, uh, costs uh, for flexibility, and that is really the difference to battery installations, for instance. Based on this, the project has two main scope items. First, thermal optimization of the energy system itself based on an innovative storage concept. The aim here is to uh, use as much as possible the balancing energy I was talking about um, to limit active generation and to also uh, push forward uh, radical decarbonization. Second, uh, after this internal optimization is carried out, um, there is still residual flexibility potential that can be used for local balancing of the power grid. And this is exactly what we want to find out and measure in clue. Next slide, please. Um, the energy system that we are currently planning and building in Shamrock Park is a flexible hybrid ActoGrid with 34 decentral heat pumps, um, roughly around uh, 5 megawatts of heat pump capacity uh, in all new buildings of the district uh, and an energy center with two CHPs supplying the building stock. The main renewable energy source covering around 50% uh, of the heating demand uh, is industrial waste heat that comes from INEOS, a chemical plant that is um, quite close to the district. Uh, and uh, those um, temperatures are quite interesting because they feed in at a low level at 35 degrees uh, centigrade. The simultaneous generation of heating and cooling uh, then leads to an estimated balancing effect of um, circa 30% of demand. That is, of course, a projection. We have to measure that then in empirics. The power generated in the two CHPs and some larger rooftop PV installations that we are planning have the potential to cover roughly around 90% of the power needed for the heat pump uh, operation. The solution uses a highly innovative storage concept uh, that is key for thermal optimization and smart sector integration. Three elements here are crucial. The large balancing unit set up uh, likely as an I storage uh, for day-to-day -day flexibility. The thermal activation of the new buildings to utilize their uh, thermal in inertia uh, on an intraday and day-night flexibility basis and the utilization of buffer storage sites, very conventional at the, at the generation units for short-term flexibility. As a result, we can reach, this is the prognosis, an electrical flexibility of circa one megawatt that can then be used for local balancing. We still have to investigate, of course, when in, in, uh, on the day this uh, capacity is available. Next slide, please, last slide. Based on this uh, Shamrock Park experience that I was um, talking about, um, let's now go back a little bit to our question from the outset, i.e. how does this local balancing work and how can we decarbonize heating and cooling at the same time? In simple terms, uh, we can cha charge the network uh, to up to 40 degrees uh, when renewable energy, either by wind or solar feed-in, uh, is available. 
we are all, uh, running the, the heat pumps in this time um, and um, uh, heating up the grid, um, of course, and the storages, of course, as well. Of course, uh, this is um, also the time when there is an abundance of power in the grid and we can uh, hence use power withdrawals to stabilize the distribution grid, first balancing effect, basically. As supply of renewable energy goes down, um, or if it goes down uh, during a day and aggregated demand goes up, uh, we switch off the decentral heat pumps and decharge the active grid. The local balancing effect is that uh, heat pumps are not run uh, when power is needed in the power network the most. So when we have in the distribution network um, capacity bottleneck um, problems. The residual uh, heat demand in these times can then also be covered uh, by the CHPs, uh, which can in turn export the power to the grid when, it, when it's needed the most. Of course, the system can be optimized in the future to flexible power prices as well, because they fit those curves fit quite well, of course, to the demand levels that we are uh, operating the, the network against. Um, which then, of course, leads to a commercial optimization that goes even further of the system. In conclusion of it all, uh, we really think that Actogrid grid can become, um, can combine uh, this uh, commercial and thermal optimization as well as radical decarbonization and can be a binding element in uh, the whole discussion of smart sector integration uh, between power, heating, um, cooling as well and gas. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Boris, thanks a lot for the presentation. <clears throat> very uh, good um, points you're taking, very amazing concept that is integrated. Um, I'm wondering if there's any questions from the audience. Um, uh, I already see one question uh, that came here from uh, one participant. <clears throat> As he uh, he's asking if the electrical flexibility one megawatt for two days, if that means uh, 48 by two equals uh, 96 megawatt hours in total. Um, I don't know what that exactly mean. Uh, both can you do you understand the question or should I should we <laughs> give him the well in 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 general that is the maximum potential that we see now in the planning phase. Uh, empirically, we have to test it, of course, um, how uh, it is available, because of course, you would uh, put the thermal optimization of the system first uh, in, in the merit order of optimization, basically, and the residual flexibility you have then uh, in the course of the day uh, can be exported to the power grid. So this is a very rough figure, don't take it for granted. Um, uh, we have to investigate, therefore we are doing this uh, innovation project clue. Uh, yes, we have um, quite a large um, theoretical um, flexibility potential on the, uh, on the electricity side. We also, of course, have to match this to the uh, flexibility needs on the distribution grid when it really makes sense to have these kind of either negative balancing uh, uh, effect or, or negative balancing energy exports or even power exports, i.e. positive exports. Okay, there is a question. Um, you know, if you see that in the chat window, how do you cover heating and cooling with the same infrastructure? How do you deal with bypass flow and the contamination of the return temperature? Um, well, in uh, in general, uh, this is um, the, the normal approach in a, uh, from a low X or an energy network with an A uh, that we are using here, um, a hot pipe and a cold pipe uh, on ambient levels uh, with uh, basically booster stations in the, uh, in the buildings. Um, um, the whole um, booster stations, i.e. heat pumps, reversible heat pumps that can uh, generate heating and cooling, um, or we use a combination of heat pumps and cooling machines in the um, in or behind the heat interface units. Um, the whole um, network is actually being steered by delta T optimization. So we really have to check um, the, the delta between hot and cold pipes in terms of temperature all the time. As I said, temperatures are fluctuating, um, are flexible. Um, 
uh, and of course this is this is the uh, um, uh, the secret you would say in German the <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the secret ingredients basically um, that that we have uh, we have a smart control solution uh, we call ExoCloud uh, that does that for us based on on sensor systems in the network um, and um, yeah that is um, that is a complex process behind it yeah. Okay, thanks both for the clarification. We don't see any more questions. We are already a bit advanced in time. So um, thanks again. I would then go to the next presentation. Uh, I, I see you put your uh, email address here. So if, if people have questions, I, I guess they can email you directly these questions. Um, obviously, if there's questions to the Clue project, I can forward the, your questions also to the uh, coordinator, a colleague of mine is coordinator. Um, so thanks again, Boris. And now coming to the next presentation um, from from Germany to Austria, uh, the Thermoflex project, a flagship project of, for flexible district heating systems in Austria that is currently undergoing. And um, Ingo is uh, Loisbrock from AEE Intech is about to present uh, the project. Ingo, can you hear us? Can you speak? Um, I can hear you. If I can speak, you have to tell me. So uh, good morning, yes, everyone. Great. So the rest should as well. I just turn on briefly the webcam for a second, so we've got a got a bit of a pace to that beautiful voice. I will turn it off in a sec again. So hi to you all. Um, starting with the presentation, what you see here on that first slide is just to give an idea about uh, how important district heating is for Austria. You see now. Uh, on this map, all district heating systems that are currently operating in Austria. So as you just can, can guess, it's a pretty large number of systems that we've operational and all of them have different challenges or the same challenges in getting on track for decarbonizing the energy supply, the heating supply. And this is something we want also to uh, address within Tamaflex. Next one, please. So we started roughly one and a half years ago with that flagship project Temaflex and our idea is there to increase the flexibility of district heating systems to make them more how to say fit for the future in terms of all the challenges that we are aware of currently uh, but I will come to that in the next slide. Uh, next slide please. So Adding a bit of, of background here uh, on the Austrian situation in terms of energy demand, what you can see is a bit of a split up between the different fractions where in Austria energy is used. And what you can see uh, on the right hand side of that pie chart is uh, the thermal demand that we have, and it's about 50% of our current primary energy demand. And of that thermal demand, 24% are currently provided via district heating. So uh, mainly for, for spatial heating, but also partially for uh, process heat. Next one, please. So, and this district heating is supplied by more than 3000 systems in Austria, uh, a lot of smaller systems, so in the range of, let's say, 20 to 200 connections, and on the other hand side, quite some large systems, um, mainly speaking about the major cities, uh, and there Vienna as one example on the other hand side of the scale with a huge system, gigantic uh, infrastructure there and also uh, tremendous capacities that have to be provi provided in peak times. Next slide, please. So um, what we, what I said in the beginning, we want to address flexibility in district heating. So currently, what we define as flexibility is mainly the ability of a system to provide in future sustainable district heating without compromising the comfort of the end user and on the, on the other hand side being affordable for everybody so the customers and uh, being well operational and well uh, controllable by the district heating operator. Uh, providing that flexibility are different elements. On the one hand side, technical measures. Next slide, please. 
So providing flexibility can come from uh, different sources that can be renewables, that can be wasted. Additionally, what you could add in there is storage for buffering either on a, on a uh, smaller time frame like like minutes to days or up to seasonal storage you can think about implementing storage as a buffer on a centralized scale on a decentralized scale you can do it small scale you can do it large scale depending on the needs and the availability of your energy sources next slide please uh, what you also have there as an option to increase flexibility is that you can go for systemic interventions that can be sector coupling or what was the new term Ralph smart uh, sector integration yes smart sector integration exactly okay so so connecting uh, the distributing system to other infrastructures mainly we are talking about currently about uh, electricity grid but we also have got options to link other infrastructures like sewage and wastewater as an energy source lots of things we can improve in the terms of, of control we can go for overall lower system temperatures. We have to think about integrating our future systems in, an, in a planning process that not only addresses the district heating system, but also, let's say, spatial development plans in a city. And these are the interventions you can think of on a, on a systemic level. Additionally, and most often, one of the most critical points are not of technical nature. So what you have to always add to this more engineering preference like technologies and systemic interventions you have to think about non-technical measures to get everybody on board to get everybody in line and speaking here about user integration stakeholder integration and of course it has to pay off financially in the final essence so we have to think about business models that are good for everybody that have an added value for everybody and also setting up cooperation between different stakeholders that might not have been in touch beforehand and all these things merge together, give us more flexibility in the system, but on the other hand side, also increase uh, the, the complexity. Next slide, please. So uh, to, to, to make a step forward in all that, we have started that flagship project, Temaflex, uh, one and a half years ago. It's a large consortium of 27 partners, uh, quite some budget involved in the research project itself as well as the demonstrators and what we want to do in Temaflex is basically cover the whole chain from having the problem somehow identified having ideas developed and concepts developed to to solve that problem up to demonstration monitoring and evaluation in the final essence next slide please um, this is part of the flag energy model region green energy lab that we have in austria and it's part of a larger batch of projects that are currently ongoing to to get the decarbonization in the district heating sector in the heat sector but also in the energy sector as a whole ongoing next slide please so how do we do we work in Temaflex? Temaflex has the idea to um, be there as what you can say as a one-stop shop for everything we've got lots of partner on board in the project that kind of got tons of experience and ideas and motivation to do something uh, we try to mix that with the demonstrators that we have currently identified for our projects next slide please and what we get from the demonstrators are on the one hand side uh, the ideas that we get from them the, the challenges next slide please uh, so we get input from them what they have got on their table currently to address on the other hand side we come up with ideas from the project itself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, how we can solve these problems. We've got ideas how we can do more things than just uh, having uh, answered the concrete questions directly. And so it's a bit of a ping pong play between the demonstrators and the Temaflex research project. And, and what should also be a major outcome of that overall project will be something like back best practices, templates for how you could solve your uh, challenges in other systems and then some blueprints. Next slide, please. So this is then what we will disseminate and have available later on in the project for, for reproduction elsewhere. Next slide, please. Uh, like mentioned, we've got seven demonstrators currently 
that we are working on in Austria, covering smaller solutions, smaller systems, but also addressing uh, larger systems like in Vienna and Salzburg. Uh, we have got plenty of things in all these demonstrators that could fit or do fit in what, what Ralf introduced as a hybrid energy network in the beginning, lots of interactions, mainly then via heat pump, but also then uh, other infrastructures like sewage and wastewater. So um, I will tell a bit more about this interaction with the wastewater uh, in the next few slides when I talk about Gleisdorf, but, but generally all these demonstrators mentioned here have got somewhere a link to, to sector coupling, because I think this is one of the major things already happening right now in the district heating sector that has potential and also will just uh, be one of the topics for the future. Next slide, please. Um, so zooming in a bit more on what we do in Gleisdorf, we've got several different elements that we that I've presented earlier going on in Gleisdorf. So think about how can you do something with uh, lower system temperatures, lower, system, lower temperature branches of the whole systems. We currently integrate different central and decentral storage options there. We think about heat pump solution as well on a building scale. So in combination with the uh, with different uh, supply from return solutions, but also on a central scale. Uh, we do lots of monitoring and control currently. So this will lead to something what we call now a virtual heating plant, monitoring and control under one umbrella and do more or less online monitoring and optimization there. Then what we also have got as a new feature there is a bit of an innovative feature is how to integrate the local wastewater treatment plant. Uh, Next point, please. Uh, what we also have seen in the past as a vital element is that we try to get all stakeholders and users on board early to get things forward. And also what we have managed is to get all this discussion about how district heating can provide a better heating supply for Gleisdorf. We managed to get that also into the spatial energy planning process of the uh, city itself. Um, I would just like to highlight in the next few slides how this was happening in the past. Uh, next slide, please. So we worked on uh, getting first of all a hold on how does the energy situation as a whole look in Gleiser. What you see here is a is a is a map and a dashboard on uh, as a result of the data that we've been collecting in the last years on Gleisdorf to get an idea how much energy is needed, what is supplied, when and where and how, because this gives us the uh, foundation to set up the next steps, how district heating can be useful and where are regions in the cities where it's not suitable. Next slide, please. From that, uh, we define different areas in the city where district heating expansion is a good option to do. What you see here in blue is existing one. What you see in red, yellow, violet, and uh, green are priority areas for the future. And what you see in these dashed lines are currently uh, extensions to other parts of the city. First of all, uh, next slide, please. Our next click is we want to connect uh, subgrid in, in, in Gleisdorf to the main system and the lower branch, click please is going down to the wastewater treatment plant that we want to integrate. And that's at the end of that dashed line in the south uh, of Gleisdorf. Next slide, please. Uh, based on these options, we did quite some simulations and studies to get a good idea of what is possible, what does make sense, what doesn't make sense and what pays off. So this is something that led them to a decision what to do in Gleisdorf. Uh, next slide, please. And this was vital for us to get everybody on board in Gleisdorf and say, okay, we're gonna do it. This is this has potential for the future. Um, zooming in again a bit more on the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is a bit farther in terms of sector coupling and hybrid than Ralf has introduced in the beginning. So we do not consider only hybrid here in this case as coupling between the electricity and the district uh, heating, but also we include here the wastewater infrastructure. 
there are plenty of changes to come up in the treatment plant in Gleisdorf because uh, it's rather old, it has to be renovated, more people being connected to it. And we perceive now the wastewater treatment plant here as a posumer. Uh, the interaction with the distributing system currently can look like, uh, we've got several options for that. First of all, click please. Um, we've got biogas being produced from the digester. And currently we are discussing options either to use it directly uh, in the system. So just burning it or use it in a CHP. Additionally, we've got the option to use the treated wastewater, click please, uh, that would otherwise be released to the surface water in combination with a heat pump here. Uh, both these options as biogas and the treated wastewater with the heat pump gives us a reasonable amount of, of uh, capacity for Gleisdorf uh, to provide a good base load in winter time and totally covers this load in summertime. Additionally, what we have now being discussed for the wastewater treatment plant is to use the surfaces there for a local PV field, click please, as an energy input. Uh, this is now all the options that we're currently discussing. We are finalizing now that concept, but the difficulty in all that does not necessarily lie in the technical features, but uh, a lot of discussions are currently going on in terms of legislative issues of how to do the business model, who is owning what, who is going to invest where and how. And so one of the discussions that still is there, click please, is how we do the connection to the district heating system. There are two options that we're currently discussing is either we put a ga gas pipeline back to the uh, main system or we discuss to have a, a district heating pipeline going down to the south of the city. So quite interesting to integrate it. Lots of options there possible and plenty of potential for the future. Click please. So with that, I would like to conclude the presentation on Temaflex. There's more information to be found on our website. Uh, if you want to know more, just drop me a line, drop me a mail, uh, check the website. And uh, well, thanks a lot for the attention. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ingo, for your presentation. Uh, we are we are a bit uh, a bit short in time, so I would uh, allow one more question. If there's any, I don't see anything in the chat window. No, there seems to be no question. Um, no. So so thanks again, Ingo, for for your presentation. <clears throat> and now I would like to go then to the to the next presentation um, from a, a colleague of mine, Edmund, who is about to present uh, something on multi-carrier distribution networks and the integrated assessment of those energy systems. Um, uh, are you uh, with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Perfect, I can hear you. Wonderful. So please, the uh, screen is yours. Okay, let's jump right in. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we already heard that there is a lot of aspects when it comes to uh, sector coupling or smart integration and whatever you call it. One of the aspects that I'm focusing on is uh, a coupling of the grids themselves, the energy grids and the effects on those. So, you know, currently grids are basically uh, operated separately. And the question is how or when you couple them, in what way can they actually, uh, how can you use synergy potentials to uh, increase efficiency and flexibility through joint operation? There are currently a couple of research points, projects going on. I just name a few here, but uh, I guess most of you are anywhere aware that much more is going on. Next slide, please. So when we talk about assessment of uh, integrated energy systems, uh, if you look at the state of the art, uh, definitely you will, uh, you will notice or probably already know that there are also many, many aspects that you can look there. 
and uh, those aspects they mostly correlate with the spatial and temporal resolution that you want to look at and also uh, the uncertainty. So uncertainty can mean a lot of things but uh, roughly it's about uh, uncertainty in, in demand but also in uh, generation. Uh, click please and uh, if you look into the questions that you can have there that you you can see that uh, these different aspects also come uh, with uh, different uh, with a different focus in on the subject so for example uh, you can look at things like medium to long uh, medium to long term national uh, scenarios which is more social science thing you can uh, look into planned investment and grid planning which is um, mostly related to economics but you can also uh, ask questions that are related to the real-time control and uh, network operation. Um, uh, click please. And it turns out if you look at the state of the art that basically the first two that uh, that I was talking about, there's a lot of lot of methods and tools available uh, to look into those things. Uh, research in, in, in that regard uh, started a couple of years back, actually a couple of decades, but the engineering part is still not very well covered. Next slide, please. Uh, and this also uh, becomes obvious if you look at the available modeling optimization tools. So if you, so this is this is not a comprehensive list; it's just a, a quick selection. But if you look at tools that um, that people are using in research, in academia, but also in industry, uh, to look into what I call the integrated energy systems or hybrid systems then you very often come across those specific tools and they have uh, the different, they have different, uh, they have each a different focus a bit. So when it comes to spatial resolution and temporal resolution and so on, but when you really come down to the itty nitty details of, of the engineering, click please, uh, then there is uh, still more or less, more or less a question mark. Uh, and it turns out, click please, that uh, if you look at the tools that are available nowadays, like for uh, simulation of district heating networks, for example, or simulation of electrical ne networks, those domain specific tools, uh, they are not by themselves capable of uh, going into the details of a joint operation of such coupled systems, but also these other tools that I show here, they're also, they're focusing on, on different aspects. So they, they're not able and they're not intended actually uh, to cover these details. So the question is what to do. Next slide, please. Uh, and the question is not only what to do, but also what is the what can you gain if you look into this part? And so obviously there is a, or not obviously, but uh, in our research, we see that there is a benefit if you look at dynamically coupled networks. What you actually want to do is on the one hand, uh, you want to uh, go into design optimization. So very often you hear the questions, yes, okay, we would be interested in doing this, but uh, what's actually the best way to go? And the other thing is, okay, if we have an idea of, of how to do it from, from, let's say, from a sizing and, and the coupling point of view, then what is the best way to actually control and operate such a network? And if you put all these things together, that's a, a, quite, a, a quite interesting engineering question. And this is actually a current research topic for, let's say, a couple of years. Next slide, please. Um, and there are several possibilities that you have to actually go into that subject. Uh, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, I mean, I could talk here for hours just on that subject, but I will go just into the one thing uh, that I am uh, that, that I'm very much uh, working with, and that is co-simulation. Co-simulation, as you might know, is the coupling of simulation tools, of already simulation tools, in one big simulation in a way that they can dynamically interact with each other and exchange data, basically acting as one big model, as one big simulation. And what I show you here is now from, from a quite recent paper. So the question is, in, in co-simulation, how can you do this combined uh, optimal design and uh, control evaluation? And we basically came up with, uh, let's say, a methodology uh, where we on the one hand side look at the, at the size of the solution space. So it could be that you say, oh, okay, I, I just have a couple of options 
probably put a heat pump of this size here and or probably put another heat pump of a different size somewhere else. Those are very limited options, but you could also have a solution space that is very large with many, many degrees of freedom. Uh, on the other hand, also the way that you want to operate the system is uh, you can do that in different ways. Uh, for example, you can do rather simple rule-based controls or you can go into optimal control. So there's a, quite a large difference in computational complexity. And we said, okay, depending on what to, uh, so looking at all these possibilities, we basically say two ways forward. And the one is what we call heuristic parameter scan and the other is what we call optimal control scan. Kick, please. And this heuristic parameter scan is basically one way uh, to uh, to look into such a system. So you see here a co-simulation. So we set up a co-simulation with a thermal model, electrical model, and an operational strategy. The operational strategy here is uh, using a rule-based controller. And this simulation as a whole is then uh, linked to a design optimizer, which uses, for example, genetic algorithms uh, to look uh, for uh, the best uh, solution. On the other hand, click please. You can also say, okay, uh, I I want to I want to go into optimal control. This still allows you to use a co-simulation approach, but you see here it's uh, uh, the, the figure tries to visualize that here the operation or here the operational optimizer is actually part of the simulation program. So you have the thermal model, you have the electrical model, and then you have an, a controller that intrinsically tries to optimize the system using typically a model-based control approach, and then you just if you have just a few candidates to, to go through, you can basically try out all. Next slide, please. Just an, as an example, so what I said is probably rather abstract. Probably this, uh, this figure here will still leave it abstract, but just so that you see, I will not go through it in detail, but uh, you can really, for these for this kinds of approaches, you can uh, in basically very detailed uh, give instructions of how to do such a optimization and, and, and simulation um, uh, assessment. So basically what I want to show you with this slide is that there are workflows, workable workflows, proven workflows, and there are also tool chains. Because if you uh, look a little bit closer here, you might see some of those symbols uh, look familiar to you. So uh, those of you uh, familiar with, uh, with simulation tools from, from the energy domain, uh, you might have come across Dixel and Power Factory. You might have come across Daimler, also Python and, and, and other things. So these tool chains, they do exist. That's kind of the takeaway from this slide. This is, uh, they're becoming more mature and available. Next slide, please. And just an example, again, due to the lack of time, I won't go into the details. Uh, but you can look really into, into interesting things, like here in this example, this is a, a sketch of, uh, of, of a small, let's say a small village or a small, a small district, uh, which with coupled networks, with a lot of things going on. So you have, uh, uh, you have a, a, of course, PV that you could use locally. You have, uh, uh, you have heat pumps and, and other things. So it's quite a complex scenario. Click, please. Uh, and what you can do is you can really in very much detail uh, simulate and analyze and then also come to a, a optimal solution uh, of what you can do in the system. Yeah. And you can then also in very much detail analyze how the control actually performed, uh, if you have bottlenecks, if you have any constraints violated and so on. Next slide, please. So this is already my conclusions. Um, I mean, this was only a very high level talk, but I, I hope I could convince you that uh, uh, technical assessments of such multi-carrier distribution systems are a complex task, but a uh, quite interesting task. And now new methods and tools that uh, are essential for such technical assessments have been developed in recent years. And one of the approaches, and uh, okay, it, it's just a personal opinion, but from my point of view, that the most successful approach so far, uh, uh, those approaches are based on co-simulation. Co they have become very mature uh, in recent years and they can be used for actually the combined optimal design and control of such systems, which is otherwise only very hard to do. Uh, if you're interested in that, of course, uh, feel free to ask questions. 
but I also give you here links to very recent uh, publications that uh, go into uh, go into all the details, all the technical details regarding also the modeling and also the tool chains and the workflows uh, for these kinds of kinds of assessments. I leave you with that and thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Edmund, for that presentation. Very good to, to get the, the a bit more theoretical, but at the end also very applied <coughs> uh, background for, for this assessment of, of control strategies in district in hybrid energy networks. Um, again, we are a bit short in time. I, I am afraid we were going to run a bit over, but we started a bit later and we had some technical difficulties, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Hopefully you all are still available with us for maybe there is one or two questions. Um, but I don't see anything now in the shared window. So if there's no one have any question anymore, I will jump then to the next presentation. Thanks, Edmund, again. Um, next presentation, now jumping to France, ACEA, uh, Research Institute, Nicolas Vassé, uh, going to present some uh, a tool for designing and assessing renewable production strategies. We're staying on the tool level very much following the last presentation. Um, Nicolas, are you uh, with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Perfectly. So then, yes. the, Great. the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll try to do my best to, to match the schedule that was, that was forecast. Um, so, um, as you said, with respect to the previous presentation, I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit on um, something that's been developed at my institute, which is the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, which is a tool, um, a simple tool, which is called uh, ENR SIM. Um, so um, the idea of this tool is to focus on design production strategies um, through a really simple approach. And the clear objective of the tool is to be quickly usable by engineering offices for um, the pre-design stage of, um, of uh, exploration for um, existing installations or uh, improvement of installations that uh, already are there. Um, so next slide, please. Um, if you can. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have a few slides of context, which I'm going to try to skim through at, uh, at, uh, at a quick pace. So here, um, the context of my institute is, um, so we are a French research entity. The aim is to provide tools and also um, some kind of a vision for low carbon energy usage uh, in the upcoming years in the, in the context of France. Um, so we use to represent this, um, uh, this, uh, this view by uh, this illustration. Um, so we, um, we have the, um, um, we have the, uh, the point of view of the, of, of the combination of a variety of sources and, of course, a variety of production means to uh, be able to satisfy multiple needs uh, in the context of district heating operation. Um, a crucial ingredient, of course, of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this view is the variety of distribution vectors at stake in the process and the ability to couple them uh, with an integration level that has to be the, 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 the best possible. Um, the idea is to satisfy needs that go from uh, mobility, energy management, and uh, typical uh, energy uses uh, in, uh, in buildings. Um, of course, one main ingredient is also the fact that the networks have to be interconnected. Uh, the scale has to be multiple, uh, so we have to go from the district scale to the regional scale, definitely, and maybe the national scale as well. Uh, decentralization is key. It's something that we are not used to in France, actually, but we are aiming to um, to, to get to this uh, uh, to this direction. And uh, the use of, of uh, intelligence through instrumentation and digitalization and the monitoring of data uh, from the consumer point of view and also from the uh, production point of view, of course, is also key to the success of this endeavor. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I, I had a I had a specific example slide here that I'm going to skim through really fast to get to the point uh, on the next uh, on the next slide. Um, a specific example of such an orientation, of course, uh, can be illustrated by by a, a study that was performed here in the context of a European project, where we try to study um, the uh, operations of a micro district heating grid um, through the production uh, means of uh, a gas boiler, heat pump, and also um, coupling with energy storage. And the aim of the study was to show uh, the advantage of uh, and, and the, um, the importance 
of uh, the, the use of advanced control strategies in order to optimize the system. Uh, optimization being performed through um, um, model predictive control uh, with respect to um, uh, export control laws. Uh, so seeing the advantage of this, uh, of this ingredient is, uh, is clear and, uh, and allows to uh, optimize uh, a system with a different and varied production means uh, in, uh, in the context of, uh, of a district heating. So this is of course something that is, um, that is definitely relevant in, the, in terms of optimization of the, of the production and distribution means. Um, so uh, going back to the, uh, to the tool that I'm trying to present here, um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, the idea here is to take a step, take a step back and um, getting to this, um, to, this, um, to this idea of uh, versatility of the production means, we are trying to, pr pr to propose to, um, um, to, the business, uh, to the business floor um, a tool that uh, is able to uh, satisfy on the first level uh, the pre-design uh, questions that, uh, that arise first when we try to uh, integrate more uh, production means to an existing system or to create, uh, possibly from scratch, um, a system that does not exist yet. Um, of course, the, um, the, um, the view is that um, district heating networks are uh, the main opportunity to distribute renewable energies and especially some uh, renewable energies that could be uh, biomass and solar heating. Um, geothermal as well. Um, there is an expected uh, development of these of these um, of these ingredients in the future, definitely. And um, the idea is to be able to uh, enable engineering offices and engineering studies in general uh, to uh, integrate more and more of those ingredients uh, in the in their studies and be able to assess really quickly what could happen. So these are what if scenarios and first assessments on these uh, on these integrations. The idea is then to provide a simplified tool. Uh, the idea is to make it accessible to everybody. So this is a tool that's going to be made publicly available in, in the coming weeks. And uh, the tool is business oriented, as you will see. And um, we try to make it as easy as possible to use for everybody and as versatile as possible. So this is something that has been performed uh, in conjunction with a, um, a governmental agency in France, which is called ADEM, which we thank for the, uh, for the support in that. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, the idea of this tool um, is to make it a simplified tool, but a calculation tool. So this is not an optimization tool. This is a calculation tool that is based on a nonlinear uh, modeling of, um, of a production system uh, as coupled to a simple, um, as coupled to a simple uh, district heating model. The technologies for production that can be used are go from solar thermal to gas boiler to biomass, CHP heat pumps. And we have the possibility to couple it to a simple um, heat storage uh, system, uh, which is um, um, used as a daily uh, daily storage uh, means for this uh, for this kind of study. Um, we are trying to obtain from uh, those simulation studies, so uh, based on um, based on these uh, based on these models, uh, energetic indicators, environmental, economic indicators that can be output directly from the tool. Um, in uh, sh the shortest number of steps possible, uh, with uh, with uh, with um, uh, always the view that this is a tool for pre-design and being able to uh, give global indicators to um, to uh, to an engineer in uh, in this uh, in this study phase. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll skim really fast to this, the tool architecture. So we have, uh, of course, um, um, a human interface. We have pre-processing steps uh, that enable to estimate the inputs, uh, external inputs, internal inputs, in terms of uh, weather data and load curves. Um, we have then the calculation core, which I will uh, explain really fast uh, in the next slides. And uh, we have then the post-treatment step. Um, so, no, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the post-treatment steps uh, enable them to compute the indicators based on the uh, um, balance and assessments of the, of the results obtained over the, the period that is computed. So we have simulations that are performed uh, basically uh, on a one-year horizon. Uh, the time step is basically one hour and uh, the calculation time for, for this kind of simulation could be something ranging from a few, um, few tens of seconds to, uh, to one minute, two minutes at most. To go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, really skimming through uh, quickly to the pre-processing. So basically, uh, the input that have to be put uh, is, uh, or basically the um, external temperature, so the solar irradiation, and also the demand that can be as coarse as monthly demand. 
From that, computations are made for the supply temperature, return temperatures for the district heating network, and um, and and mass flow rates, so based on uh, on temperature laws that have to be provided as well. And there is a focus on the tool on solar heating uh, production uh, means um, through specific computations of uh, solar power uh, capacities based on, of course, irradiation, but also uh, the profile of the of the of the site where the, um, the installation is located through uh, the horizon uh, profile and also internal shading through the geometry of the sensors. So this is something that has been um, uh, one focus of the of the tool. Next slide, please. Um, so computation is performed through um, 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 models that are based on the Modelica library uh, that we developed at our laboratory. So this is the district heating library in the um, in the uh, in the Modelica uh, language. Uh, we embed this in um, basically in a DLL, um, an, an FMU uh, unit that is able to communicate with external um, external uh, comp computational units, which are here the control units, uh, and the cost simulation is performed then. Uh, for, so from the model, we compute all the um, uh, all the operations through expert laws. Uh, so this is what's, um, what uh, what makes the software. Um, an evolution that is foreseen for the next months is to uh, add then model predictive control to get to the next step that I uh, quickly presented in, the, in, the, in one of the first two slides. Next slide, please. Um, I'll just end this presentation by some visuals on the tool. Um, basically, the idea is to show you so what it looks like and what could it be to, to, uh, to interact with it. Uh, so the tool uh, first um, uh, requires a, a few data about the external conditions, uh, so external temperature and also the irradiation, which are providing as a typical input files uh, with, a, with a minimal formatting. Uh, at this point, we have not dis defined the architecture of the system. There is no need for that for the moment. Um, next slide, please. Um, then um, the requirement is to, um, uh, to provide uh, internal boundary conditions such as, the such as the demand from customers in the district heating uh, network uh, and also the typical, um, the typical temperature lows that can be, um, that can be uh, foreseen um, in the upright panel here. So the supply temperature in the heating season, in non-heating season, that will be um, required to compute then the monotonic curves for uh, heat demand and also the supply temperatures and return temperatures as um, as um, discretized at the Hauer uh, at the Hauer level. Next slide, please. So once we have uh, computed what is uh, required and the uh, and the boundary conditions of the system, we can define the geometry and basically the the architecture of the production side. Um, and here we are able to uh, basically. Um, interact with the software through block um, block modeling um, with uh, so the blocks that are available that we discussed earlier so uh, heat pump biomass the solar heating uh, we have chp and also we have the storage uh, the storage unit that we can use um, the idea is to make it as as uh, easy as possible to set up in a few few tens of minutes so we have a parameter set of course for each element so simple parameter set advanced parameter set so that we can um, we can um, modify uh, at will uh, global parameters for the production step for the production uh, site sorry and then we are able to make the simulation um, based on the previous uh, requirements and the simulations provides the results next slide please um, so the results are provided so in uh, inside inside the software in a, in, a, in a simple window for for visualization as you can see here so on the on the upper panel you can um, have a look at demand with respect to what can the solar heating um, field provide and what uh, is the operation of the storage unit, what is the operation of the heat pump here, which is not working uh, so much uh, at this period that I show here because, uh, because there is so much sun. Um, and, uh, and the typical global curves here, um, which is, uh, so this, uh, this view is supplemented by a report that is automatically generated and is able to make Quick assessments on the on the on the system out, uh, and of course post processing uh, is always possible by output files as uh, as almost always in this kind of uh, in this kind of software. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a sum up slide. Um, so the the point to take home is that this uh, this tool is um, currently in beta testing, but is going to be made available really quickly in at our website that is mentioned on the on the bottom of this slide. Uh, so the, the deadline is uh, next June, 
So um, the idea is to make it freely available to everybody so that uh, people can um, can assess uh, assess quickly the usability and the uh, and the uh, and uh, the, the, um, the advantages that this tool can 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 give to um, uh, to, uh, to to the engineers. Um, the integration is then made uh, through model eco simulation models, but uh, this is something that is completely encapsulated, so uh, no no requirement in there. Um, Degree is as user friendly as possible. I hope that um, that you you might be convinced about that uh, uh, based on what we uh, what we saw. Um, the main uh, important uh, point is to uh, uh, is to make it really modular and make it available quickly for for, for studies uh, in uh, in all contexts. Um, thank you for that. I think uh, I think I get over time, but I I swear I did my best. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nicola. Uh, we are fine. We are, we are five minutes over. Uh, the the um, block is actually ending. Uh, so thanks again for your presentation. Uh, uh, actually, I don't see uh, any urgent questions in the chat window. Um, if there are any, I, I guess uh, you are still available. Uh, you have your email address. I think it's in the presentation. If not, I, I hope you can. You're able to share that email address with others. Absolutely. And I can, can send it to those who are, have questions. Um, we are finalizing the first block, but as I mentioned, um, just one one thing to be done: the group photo. Um, I, there's I, um, Web Co. The um, the program Go to Meeting allows only 25 presentation coming at the same time. So um, uh, let's turn on our webcams after 25 person. It is not allowed anymore. We will not be able to see anymore um, the uh, more people are coming. So then, after the first 25 have been photographed, we make uh, everybody who is visible will need to turn off again, and we will then take the other 25 to be turned on. So we have no. I think that's about 30 now. So I'm gonna make the first part of the group photo. I will stay on all the time to have me. So uh, then let's say all of us TS3, please. So screenshot, make another one for be sure. And the uh, next one, wonderful. So now everybody who you can see, please turn off your webcam that it is allows the other ones that are not yet on the screen to be turned on. That works very well, perfectly. So just finally people to turn off the webcam and then I guess the others that have not been seen can now turn on their webcam. I will stay since I'm the moderator. Uh, now please everybody else turn on their webcam. Oh, I see we are have places where you will still have night. Um, so is there any more who's willing to turn on their webcam just to have a good group photo? We have still, uh, we should be able to have two full pictures of, of people. Now people are coming with their webcam, wonderful. Anyone else interested to turn on the webcam? We wait a couple of minutes to have more webcams online, but maybe people don't want to, that's fine. You're not forced to turn on your webcam. Um, Okay, now people are joining slowly. I think that's good for now. So I know I make the second official screenshot and I think that's the final one since there are not more people willing to join. Wonderful. So then let's everybody say again TS3 and smile to the camera. Let's see. I'm going to make some screenshots. Nope, Hi. people are joining again. Oh, there's other people coming. But welcome to faces. No, we are here. Okay, then I'm gonna try another one. Perfect. Good. So thanks a lot for your participation. Uh, see you again in most of you hopefully again at uh, 1 p.m. at Central European time. Uh, thanks a lot for, for participating. Sorry again for technical difficulties we had. 
um, um, I will hope I hope I'm gonna be gonna be smoother the next time and we don't have so many presentations next time and more interactive elements uh, looking forward for the second floor uh, so have a good lunch um, and see you then bye bye This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everybody to the second webinar on hybrid energy networks, Austria Gauss International. Uh, this webinar is held at the Framework of the International Cooperation Programme, IEA DHC Annex Tier 3 Hybrid Energy Networks. We talked in the first block a bit about that. If you missed the first vlog, don't worry. We had a recording of the webinar, so you should be able to uh, watch the first vlog of the webinar uh, on YouTube. That will be put on YouTube uh, not tomorrow, but maybe the next week. My name is Ralf Roman Schmidt. I'm from AIT uh, in Austria, the largest uh, Austrian non-university non research organization. You have my contact details here for if you have any other questions, and you can check the website below if you want to directly go to the Annex Tier 3. There's a bit of information online. Now, um, going to the second uh, block, the first thing you might already listen, to, hear the voice of uh, GoToMeeting. This webinar is recorded, as I mentioned. Also, the second part will be available on, on YouTube worldwide. We'll send out the um, presentation slides to you directly. And also, I would like to already notify you, we will have a group photo at the very end of the seminar. So please be prepared to turn on your webcam. Uh, obviously, if you don't want to, uh, uh, you don't have to. If you don't, uh, if, if, if your background is not nice, uh, you can change that now. You still have uh, one and a half hours for 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 this to to do the webinar. Uh, to do the group photo. We have a lot of participants. It have been about now. We are already 60 in the room. Uh, it, there's about 160 registered, so still might come. Still, some might still come, but we already start with some some introductory words uh, now. Um, some just some hint you if you are uh, working on your computer if you're using your computer for logging to the webinar you might see these um box here and there's a couple of elements i would like to highlight the first one you uh, on the left uh, uh, top part you can mute yourself and unmute yourself you also can turn off your webcam and i would like to ask you to do that unless uh, we're doing the um the present and we go through to at the very end and at the very bottom, there's a chat window where you can chat, uh, send a chat message to me and to everybody if you want to speak, if you want to have a, you can put the question directly in, or you can also speak yourself. And also very uh, convenient, our uh, top right part of the panel is a small symbol where you can minimize the panel. That's very helpful. Then you can see the screen a bit better. Some general rules for participation in the webinar. As I said, microphone should be muted by default. If if you talk, yeah, obviously if you talk, that that needs to be turned on. If you want to talk, uh, you, the best would be to use the chat window to uh, write a short LTS request to speak. Um, and then I can I can ask you to to do so. Uh, also, please state your name and institution before you speak. Uh, as I said, webcam should not be turned off all the whole time except at the end at the group photo and be cautioned with humor and sarcasm that is a bit difficult to understand um, in an online format like this.
Um, we had a, now we have a, the second block of the webinar, as I said, uh, is, is now upcoming. Um, we have a, four interesting presentations from the technological point of view, um, um, but also two uh, scenarios for Austria. This is a webinar and is very much focused on the Austrian situation. Actually, the background here is that it was initially planned as a physical workshop in Austria with a lot of Austrian speakers. Now we turn it into an international webinar. Still, Austrian speakers remain, but we are happy to have some international. In the first block, we had uh, international speakers. Now we have Peter Serkness from Marburg University as international speaker. The second part of the first block today is the uh, SWOT assessment I will introduce that is based on the work of the IEA Annex TS3. Um, and then, very interesting, we have an uh, online voting and a discussion round. Um, I already can tell you now what we discussed at the very end, to, that, that may, that, so you are able to prepare yourself. So first of all, we use an online voting system that's called Slido. Uh, you can, if you want already now, but the questions are not yet available. The questions will be available at the end when I, when I uh, make them available. But you can already open the website either using slido.com and then type in these uh, five-digit code. 40284, or you can use the QR code and scan it on your mobile phone and will direct you to the website we need. Now oh, that is that is that is used for the voting. We have three questions, and if you want, you can already think about these three questions now. We can and again we will at the end ask them individually. You type in your, your answers to these questions. The first question is what are the key elements of hybrid energy networks from your point of view? So what is it, is it a heat pump? Is it a control? Is it uh, a CHP? What is the key element that he, he hybrid energy network is characterizing or is, is uh, important for hybrid energy networks? Second question is what are the most important advantages and disadvantages or in this case strengths, opportunities, weaknesses and threats of hybrid energy networks from your point of view? And the third question uh, for improving the, and accelerating the implementation of hybrid energy networks. So, so if you want to have more of them or better hybrid energy networks, what are the most important measures from your point of view? Measures related to policy, regulations, markets, awareness raising, training, technologies, tool development, and all these things. Yeah. Think about these questions already now, make some notes, uh, and we will discuss all these points a bit more in detail. You will see presentation on a couple of these points. And at the very end, we have the live voting, and you can put it in. Now, without further ado, going to the first question, Daniel Muschik from Best Research uh, from Austria. Uh, we'll talk about an energy modular energy management system, optimal optimization of cross sectoral energy systems, a bit um, uh, uh, following the points we had in the first webinar. Daniel, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Daniel Muschik. I'm from BEST uh, Bioenergy and Sustainable Re uh, Technologies. And uh, we are a research institute also in Austria, um, also non-university. And part of us, or a, gr a group of us, is working on energy management systems, especially for cross-sectoral energy systems. So next, please. OK. so. I'm, I'm more or less a follow up on this on the talks before Edmund Beadle in the first session has already talked about co-simulation and about the challenges that happen here because we have the intercoupling of different sectors of heat, cooling, but electricity, gas sector as well. So if you have this grid next, um, we have to be very active here, Ralph. <laughs> so next, please. So what are the challenges? We have the integration of renewable but volatile energy sources that we can't control. So I'm speaking from the point of view of the operator of such a network or of the operator of a coupling point inside of such a network who provides heat to the network, but also possibly electricity to the electricity sector. Next. So this is the, the increased coupling problematics that you have. It's not only about which uh, things you install in your system, but also that you have to deal with different systems in the background. You have the, the electricity market on the one side, but you also have the, um, the heating sector segment on the other side. So also not only in points from the point of view of technology, but also from the point of view of econom economics and business, things get really complicated here. Next. Okay. 
And especially if you think about the electricity sector, we haven't talked about this too much right now. Everybody says, okay, we have varying uh, energy tariffs. So maybe we would have to operate our systems in, not on a, on a strict way that uh, every time um, I need heat, I also operate my, my CHP, but maybe I will operate the CHP more oriented on the, on the electricity sector. But what does this really mean in, in terms of, of, of planning and of a preparation. It's not that you can just say, okay, the price will increase in the future because you need to have a forecast of the price, how it will develop. And there are multiple markets that you have to think about. There's the intraday, there's the day ahead market, there's the balancing energy market. So things get really complicated there as well. Next. And all the time, you also have to ensure that your customers, of course, um, satisfied that they get the heat that they want, that they get the electricity that they want, and you need to do this at low cost. So you need possibly a tool that helps you uh, take care of all of this complexity. And this tool can't be very expensive because if you have to do it yourself, um, there's a lot of development cost going into it. So you probably, you probably need a system that is uh, pre-fabricated and that you can configure easily for your own use case. Next, please. So what's very important about this system is that it doesn't only know all of, the, of all of the sectors, it also needs to know about the future, or at least have to have a, a vision of the future. Ralph, you can click a few times now to finish this. So, and stop. Um, so we need forecasts, not only from the yield from renewable resources, but also from the energy demand and the energy tariffs so that we can do an effective buff and battery management. Um, that we can participate in the energy markets uh, with good knowledge of what, what we are doing and therefore can define a good cost efficient unit commitment of the producers that we have, the CHP plants, the gas boilers, the heat pumps, whatever. So we need a, a predictive control strategy to operate our system. Next. So if we have our system on the left, this is operated by low level controllers. And now the important part about going into the future is the next step, next please, that we have a SCADA system, a supervisory control and data acquisition system that actually takes all of this information that's within your system and combines it as a, as a single point that you can access. Next. Also important is that you use weather forecasts or other forecasts, price forecasts, whatever, from external providers or from your own sources, uh, so that you have some notion about what will happen in the future, at least from this point of view. Next. On the other hand, you will have this huge block, which I just call energy management system. What this does is it takes these forecasts that are really abstract. It's just, okay, so later irradiation or exterior temperatures and stuff and generates um, forecasts of your of your units that you have in your system. So the volatile production and demand in your system of power, heat and cooling. And then it needs some kind of a model of your system so that it can say, okay, with this forecast, um, if I operate the systems that are currently in this state, in this, uh, in this uh, given way, I get the perfect result. So you have to have a, an optimization problem formulation that takes your configuration in and gives the results to a solver. This is a, a commercial project normally that takes this uh, optimization problem and gives it the best solution. And this best solution is then interpreted, maybe some post-processing, maybe some KPI evaluation and given back to, to the system that you operate. Okay, next. So what does this operating, uh, this energy management system do? It delivers an operating strategy. It's unit dispatch, which units to turn on and off to produce the heat or the power. Uh, possibly also if you have modulating systems, the set points, should they run at full power or at, at minimum power. And from this, it's the results, the charging and discharging of thermal storages or batteries, if you have uh, power batteries, and also how much energy will consume or purchase from the networks but also um, how much energy you should probably sell on the markets, on the future market, on the day ahead market or so on. Okay, next. And okay, another one. So what we need is this, are these specifications. This is really what makes this unique. So the energy management system, it's a modular energy management system. It can run with whatever you give it. And what it really does depends on how you specify what your system looks like. 
Okay, next. So you can see this in a bit, a little bit bigger now. So the idea is we've seen this in an NR system, NRSIS, NR SIM, sorry, from Nicolas Vassé this morning. Um, we also have a similar way of defining things. So you have a model of building blocks that you just can connect. So you have the the usual technologies, a heat pump, a, a cooling tower, photovoltaics, battery, and so on. And you can just connect them. And what you see in the different colors, those are the different uh, vectors. So um, heat, uh, power, and cooling. And it's very easy for you to combine the elements that you have in your system. You just have to specify the maximum capacitance, um, the maximum up and down times, uh, the heat up ramps, and so on. Whatever information you have, the more information you have, the, the better the results will be, of course. And what's very important is that from those building blocks, also the, the forecasts of your yields or demands are automatically generated. So this system bases on data. It's data driven. It takes your measurements. It takes the weather prediction or the weather forecasts. And from these historic measurements and this forecast it generates automatically forecasts for your PV yield, for your heat demand, for your power demand, and so on. Okay, next. What is also defined next is the interface. So this is a very important point because your SCADA, that's your product, the energy management system, that's either our software or someone else's software, and what's need, what needs to be defined is this interface. And this is the only thing that probably needs to be custom built at the moment. There are also projects, of course, which look at interoper interoperability, and there are trends to standardize this, but in the end, you will have to manage this, this data interface, how data is coming from the SCADA to our system and back. And what's at least a, a help here is that the specifications will be automatically um, converted into requirements on this data interface. Okay, if I have a PV system, of course, I need to have a, a power meter that, that tells me how much this has generated and so on. Okay, next. In practice, um, in practice, what you have is a little bit of um, unsecureness, uh, uncertainty at the operator point of view. So if you really want to do this, not in simulation, but actually at the real a power system, a power plant, um, industry site, whatever, you have an operator who doesn't maybe trust the things that go on here in the first place. So in the beginning, you will probably have a decision support system that just gives the operator a, a plan of what will happen in the next 24 hours or 48 hours. And he can say, OK, I'm agree, I agree with this. This seems reasonable and can say yes or no whether to, to activate this or not. And then after some time, if, if this has gone well for quite some time, uh, after some point, the, the operator will not be active or not be needed anymore. Um, what I also wanted to add here is that, of course, we need some other external information in the future. And this is the spot market prices. You see the APG, that's the Austrian power grid. Um, that's the Austrian power grid um, operator. So if you want to participate in energy markets and electricity markets, you need, of course, to have information about historic prices, about future prices as well. And then this information can also be used to give information to the trader um, to give um, to, to, to make good um, yeah good trades in the future with your with your possibilities. So normally for one operator, this is probably not even so relevant, but more and more pooling pooling solutions or energy communities uh, come into play, and then multiple providers can. Put together so that they fulfill their minimum requirements to the facility. And then you need to have some support to the trader of what, what he should do to, to sell your energy or, or buy energy. Okay, and next. So we at best we have done a few implementations, so you can see that this is actually quite old. So the first was just a demonstrator concept in Cross Chanel. Uh, where we actually modeled the entire grid and, and tried integrating multiple prosumers into this grid. Next. Then uh, a much more complicated system, our old name was Bioenergy 2020 Plus back then, uh, was at the Innsbrucker Kommunalbetriebe, so in Innsbruck in Austria. 
they had a demonstration project where they had a really nice combination of various technologies. So you see in the, at the bottom that you had the heat pump buffer storage is power to heat, combined heat and power, battery storage, PV, and uh, grid connection. And you had a, an interconnection between those buffer storages, so you had to transport heat from one building to the other. And managing all of this is quite complicated, and our energy management system was, was able to do so and has been running for a year now, and we are starting to look into the data now to see how well it actually performed. Next. Uh, we are also working with an industry partner on automating their industry production site. They have really interesting applications here because they also already participate in the balancing energy markets. So at some points in time, they need to uh, use energy from the grid and uh, some, some um, devices can't be operated during this time, not actively by us anyway. There are huge uncertainties because uh, some uh, engines sometimes work, sometimes they don't, uh, if they're in tests, in, in, in the testing phase. And yeah, so we're working with them. And next. And we are also working on, in other projects, also simulation projects, uh, starting from family homes, where you can already think about the energy requirements for energy management systems if, if you have a buffer storage, solar thermal, biomass boiler, whatever, so that you maximize the yield from solar thermal and um, also maximize the comfort to the home. And we're also having projects in the agro-industry of integrating solar thermal into, into industry. Next. So just a few last points. So the potential for industry here, how, how can such an energy management system help you directly? It makes uh, an integration of renewables much easier because all this uh, volatility can be taken into account. Uh, another group in our, in our institute uh, have developed a tool called Optin Grid, uh, which is actually an optimization tool for the, for the planning phase. So which components to buy and at which size. So they have um, an optimization around our optimization so they optimize something or, and then our our, opti our operation operating system so this energy management system actually controls the system for one year and we look at the results and then change the, the configuration and so and yeah so with simulations you can see how big the potential actually is and if you then actually use optimization based operation you should make sure that whatever you have planned in the beginning actually it turns out like this in in reality so often you plan something and you think ah those technologies make sense and then you buy them and you build them up and then they aren't often operated in the correct manner and and you have much worse cops and, and uh, yeah higher costs and not so much reward next and yeah so the support for participating in the energy markets i think this is this will be very important in the future because if everybody has to choose here for themselves or if everybody has to play trader it's going to be complicated next and yeah okay so if you operate this and you have something that op uh, gives you an optimal strategy for the next 24 hours and you say okay this is fine then uh, possibly you have a reduction of on-call stuff that you need so next just the last quick slide of conclusion and outlook so stop here <laughs> a little bit back so what is important is this modularity which means that a system once defined can be used everywhere more or less with a, with quick configuration both in the planning and the operation phase uh, the data-driven approach helps you to get uh, forecasts quickly without having to define your yearly curves and so on and what we are currently also doing research on this uh, technology flexibilization, which means that we are also looking at the individual technologies. Next, um, for example, the biomass boiler or the, the heat pump. So we have this EMS, this energy management system on top, which plans ahead for the next 24 hours. And if you have slow technologies, biomass boilers or something like that, that need some time to warm, warm up, or if you have differences in, in, the, in emissions if you have to start up fast or slow you can use this knowledge about the future to turn on and off your plants in a better and more controlled manner to have less emissions and more efficiency that's what we are working on at the moment next yeah and uh, also demand side management is a very important point it's not only on the production side it's very much on the demand side we are doing this on in home automation to really use the the mass of the building as a as a storage more or less 
but this is still in its infancy at our institute at least. Okay, thank you. Next step. Yeah, varying temperature levels. This is also very important, um, especially if you think about low energy grids or low temperature grids. And what this means, whether you operate the system at the higher temperature or the lower temperature, we will also be able to, to handle that. Okay, next. This should be it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, uh, we're a bit uh, over time. So if there's one or two short questions, uh, <clears throat> we can uh, consider them at the moment. I don't see anything yet. In the chat window, seems to be everything clear what you presented. Anyways, as you mentioned, there is your email address and even your phone number. So if there's any other questions, um, we will send out either you may, may note them now down now, or we will send out the presentation slides in the next days, as I said, most likely next week. So you can uh, ask a question directly to Daniel. So thank you, Daniel, then for your presentation again. We go then to the next one going more, even more into the technological details. Before we go to the scenarios, we go uh, uh, looking into cogeneration tree generation concepts using lithium bromium absorption machines for heating and cooling. Uh, Harald uh, Platzek from Steps Ahead, another Austrian company. Um, Harald, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, the screen is fine. So welcome from my side. Thank you for being able to uh, present here. And it's actually out of my business uh, field, a small detail, the uh, cogeneration and the tri-generation systems. And my aim is to show how we can increase efficiency of these systems pretty easily, simply by using another machine. Uh, who is, next slide please. Who is steps ahead? Uh, I have founded together with a partner this company three and a half years ago. We focus on absorption machines and looking on our income situation in the company, we earn approximately 90% of our income from selling machines and 10% uh, from planning from consultancy. But when you look on our workload, we work the, exactly the other way around. Approximately 90% of our work is consultancy, is uh, thermodynamic engineering, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the photo you see is one of the two uh, absorption machines in Klagenfurt. They have approximately 100,000 kilogram or 100 tons of operating weight, and they work in biomass power plants. Next slide, please. Looking on the topic for today, Everybody knows what is meant with the cogeneration, was what is meant with tri-generation, but nevertheless, I wanted to have one slide on that. And cogeneration, you simply take the heat from the engine and you take the mechanical power, turn it to electricity. No need to explain it right here. Tri-generation system is more or less the same. You're using the heat that comes from the engine for driving a so-called lithium bromide absorption chiller. That is a chiller that can be driven by heat. And in typical systems, uh, all the heat coming from the engine, what is this heat? This is the flue gas, this is the oil cooler, the water cooler from the jacket water, and in uh, many turbocharged engines, the air cooler. And uh, standard systems bring all these heat sources down to one uh, temperature level of producing hot water at 100 degree or at 95 degree, 90 degree, whatever, and feed a so-called single stage machine. Next slide, please. So let us have a look in this single stage machine. What is it doing? How can you uh, provide cooling by feeding the machine with heat? This is not difficult to understand, and I start in the a picture in the bottom right, uh, bottom left corner in the evaporator. This machine works under vacuum conditions or at very low pressure. We have in this evaporator a pressure in a range of uh, approximately 8 millibar, meaning we have a boiling temperature for water. Uh, uh, the 8 millibar pressure is boiling temperature of roughly uh, 4 degrees C. And so when I have a heat exchanger in this chamber and I irrigate water 
on the uh, heat exchanger, it immediately turns to steam because it is above boiling point. <laughs> and continuously, you bring in additional energy by bringing in 12 degree water to the heat exchanger. So this evaporation of water provides the cooling effect for the building or for the air conditioning system. And uh, it comes to a stop. The process comes to a stop if you don't have a second uh, uh, item in the same chamber on the same pressure level. Why does it stop? That's simply explained. If you produce more and more gas, steam, from the evaporation, the pressure is rising. With the pressure, the temperature is rising and the machine does not uh, cool anymore. And compression machines suck out the vapor of the refrigerant and compress it. Absorption machine absorbs uh, the uh, refrigerant vapor, the water vapor. And this is done in the second part of this lower chamber in the absorber. Highly concentrated salt solution, a solution of 60% lithium bromide salt and 40% of, of water is irrigated above the next, uh, on the next heat exchanger. And these droplets of uh, salt solution, they catch the steam and bring it back to liquid phase. By this, uh, the pressure level is maintained on the same level in the machine and uh, we can continue to cool. So uh, we are almost through the functional principle of this machine. Uh, it's just the result of this process of evaporator and absorber. It's diluted salt solution and this solution at low salt concentration is brought with a pump to the generator. There you add the heat for boiling up the salt solution and you separate it again to concentrated solution and to pure water, which you need uh, in a continuous process, in a continuing process in the lower chamber of the machine. Next slide, please. Coming from the simple machine to the so-called multi-fuel machine, which is very similar to a double stage chiller, but it is not completely the same. Uh, when you look on the temperature, you again identify the salt solution, the orange fluid, and you can identify that we have got uh, an additional generator, the so-called HTG or high temperature generator. In this generator, you boil up the weak salt solution and the driving energy in, in dry generation system is the flue gas of the engine. Boiling up the solution produces steam. This goes via the yellow pipe to the so-called low temperature generator, the LTG, and is there used as driving energy for boiling up a second set of uh, weak salt solution. And this is why this type of machine brings out of the same amount of uh, uh, driving heat, the higher output of cooling. And special machine and the difference to the uh, standard double stage chiller in the low temperature generator you will see in red an additional heat exchanger that uh, brings in heat to the low temperature generator in form of hot water from the jacket water of the engine from the oil cool cooler etc cutting a long story short this approach is needs a machine that is 50%, 70, 80% more expensive than the single stage chiller, but it brings 40% more cold water production when being used as a chiller. Next slide, please. We live in moderate climates. In summertime, we need cooling. In wintertime, we need heating. Now we look on exactly the same machine in winter operation. Uh, you don't earn money only during summertime with cooling. You also earn money in a dry generation system with selling heat. And uh, when you have a chiller already on site available, and with, when you do not need to pay for the driving energy of the chiller, it is a very logical uh, decision for using this machine in wintertime for delivering cold water or in other uh, words for uh, receiving low temperature heat from the flue gas system. You see on the bottom left side the connection to the evaporator 
energy from flue gas condensation in the bottom left. This actually increases the fuel efficiency of your whole uh, cogeneration system in this case to up to more, uh, more than 100% of the uh, calorific value of, the, uh, of uh, the gas, the driving gas. In other words, using uh, this machine in wintertime for heating brings you 20 to 25% more hot water produ production than what, you, what you, you would get from an ordinary uh, cogeneration system. Next slide, please. This is such a type of absorption machine. It's almost the same. We have installed this machine in 2017, 2018 in, uh, a, uh, on the site of company Wienerberger in brick manufacturing. Left side is the high temperature generator. Uh, right side is the rest of the machine. Thank you. Next slide. Simulating the machines uh, you will be able to zoom in into this uh, later on when the uh, uh, presentation is published. You see the two red uh, dots in the drawing. These are the generators of the absorption machine. The violet point in the middle and uh, lower end in the middle is the absorber and left, uh, uh, left bottom left corner evaporator and condenser on top. Uh, when simulating such a machine, when considering projects, you must be able to understand your machine pretty well. You must be able to calculate uh, part loads uh, so that you can really make prediction for the operational behavior. This picture actually is for a double stage chiller, which is very, very, very similar to the multifuel chiller. Next slide, please. This is a sample simulation for the same machine being used as a double stage heat pump. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the pre last slide already. System integration. You see on the left side two yellow blocks. These are uh, Jenbacher uh, G620 machines, two of them. And you see as a brown line the flue gas system, the flue gas system being connected to the heat pump that is on top, on top in violet. and all these uh, circuits, all the processes within the heat pump, they are done in one simulation. So uh, we are able to help you with uh, detail. We, can, we are able to uh, answer detailed questions, part load questions, etc., etc. Next slide, please. Once more, the picture from Wiener Berger, and thank you for your attention. I'm one minute over the time, but I think it is still sufficient if you should have some questions. Perfect. Thank you, Harald, for the insight into the technical, some technical aspects of uh, trial generation. Uh, it's part CHP is, from my point of view, people talk about heat pumps a lot since CHP is a quite well established technology, but going to micro CHP, smaller CHPs, and also looking at these cooling aspects and tri-generation is also an important aspect when it comes to sector integration and hybrid energy networks. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I don't see anything at the moment in the chat window. Just wait a bit. No, there seems to be no question. Again, there's the uh, email and telephone number if you have any questions to highlight. Or if you want to install such an absorption chiller at your own energy uh, supply system, uh, he, I'm pretty sure he will be happy to support you with this one. No doubt. Great, thanks, Harald, sure. again. Perfect. Now going to the next. Bye now bye. we're going to. Uh, bye. We. Uh, switch a bit uh, or we, we go we, we have been very much on the tool side uh, um, on the technology side now we're going a big step uh, out of these uh, zooming a big step on the, on the high level going to a, a national wide scenarios national wide strategies first Peter Sognes from Aalborg University Denmark on the results of the heat roadmap Europe project for Austria uh, Peter are you with us yes I'm with you can you hear me Hello, can you hear me? So then, um, yes, please okay. start your presentation. 
Okay, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Peter Sorkness. I'm from Albu University in Denmark, and I'll present you some of the results from Heat Realm Europe uh, with the specific case for Austria. Next slide, please. So our purpose in Hebrew Map Europe was to create um, scientific evidence to support long-term energy strategies at local, national, and EU level um, in order to go for this large low-carbon energy system, as we see it according to the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, so that's the focus here, I can say. And we want to do that by quantifying some impacts of various alternatives for the heating and cooling sectors, which we have seen as being a bit neglected, uh, at least on the European scale. Uh, within this context. Uh, and the results I'll present here is from a three year uh, project with 24 partners and advisors with different expertise and stuff like that. So if there's details that you want to know that I cannot answer, I mean, feel free to go in, everything is published, the project is done as such. Uh, and I'll, there's a link in on all the slides and there's a link also in the very end. So next slide, please. So we look into the 14 largest uh, heat demands in Europe, as highlighted here on the map. Uh, and there is more all conclusions here that we can see that everywhere there should be deep energy savings. We can see some that there has to be a combination of savings and supply and understanding of these correlations between the two. And in all, all there's around 30 to 50 percent demand reduction. We can see that should occur uh, from economic point of view, social economic point of view. Uh, and then there's some specific details here and there. Uh, and but I will not talk so much about the overall results and will focus on the Austrian case here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but on the European scale, we can see that we have talked about before, presented before, that the heating demand um, is actually quite substantial uh, throughout Europe. So even though that the focus maybe have been more on the electricity sides, that the, the, oh, the largest demand is actually the, the heating demands, uh, which you can see here highlighted for it. Here. And we also look into cooling, but as you can see here also, cooling is actually not a large chunk um, of the overall demand, and especially and also not for Austria. So I'll not discuss this as much. Uh, it's maybe something that could be interesting to look more into, but the focus here and the Hebrew Map Europe study has actually been the heating supply, but the cooling has also been uh, evaluated, but I will mostly talk about the heating sector. here. Next slide, please. So here you can see what we found. We saw some similar numbers, or maybe the exact same numbers uh, earlier in this presentation for how the uh, heating demand in Austria is uh, now it's split up, and you can see here it makes up large the, the of the induced demand, the largest chunk, around 52% of the final need demand. Uh, and you can see here most of around 50% of that goes to space heating, and around 41% goes to process heating um, going forward. And um, so we can see here that in Austria, like in the general European case, heating demands is extremely important to go forward and look into these low carbon uh, scenarios and how we're going to process that or these. So in order to estimate these a bit more, because uh, heating and cooling demands are very locally situated. So of course, we also need to understand the local topography and the local demand situation. So in order to do that, there was a mapping done. Next slide, please. For the entire European, uh, for the entire EU, uh, based on some data that's available for all European countries. So the data is on European scale data, and you can say maybe there could be some more better local data and some better uh, data for specific areas where they might have some more details. Um, but this area is a European project, of course, with focusing on so many countries. So the focus is also on getting data that's available here. But here is just the case of Vienna, and where you can see here there's actually quite a high heat demand density uh, in large chunk of Vienna. And there's also quite a lot of industrial excess heat potentials and some co-generation uh, excess heat potentials uh, located. So this is a maybe a very good case for district heating and already there. And you can see also that we then try to map what is the cost uh, based on these uh, heat densities uh, for supplying district heating. So you can see that on the graphs up here and the black line as the general one for all of Europe and the red one then is specifically for Austria. So you can see at some point around 40, around 30, 40% 
the cost in Austria seems to increase quite a lot, which could indicate that there is uh, some very uh, dense uh, rural areas and then, uh, no, sorry, not rural areas, urban areas, and then some less, uh, less dense uh, rural areas that occur at some point, and then it becomes, of course, much more expensive to supply the, the heat uh, demand there with district heating. So we use this data and these information here to go in and then ask the question, well, how much should we then uh, use of district heating and how much should we then go in and make energy savings for? So there's also cost curves related to what is the cost of doing energy savings in, 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 these savings in specific countries. And I'll not go so much into details because that's a whole lot of discussion, but I'll just show the result. Next slide, please. Where you can see here, we then try and, and model and this results cost here, that's for the entire energy system, I should start by saying. So that means that we include uh, transport demands, we include uh, industrial access heat demand, of course, and heat demands and cooling demands, but also electricity demands. So also supplying the electricity and having vehicles and stuff like that. So that it's a quite large number, you can say, based on that. So, But it includes all energy sectors and transport, um, supplying that in our model. Um, and you can see here, we then try and say, well, what, what happens when we then increase the district heating uh, potential, the, the percentage of uh, realized district heating, how much we go up to based on what we can find as te technical uh, potential uh, in Austria. And we then also highlight at the same time, well, what if we do uh, additional energy savings compared to a baseline scenario uh, where there already are some uh, expectations to the energy savings going on. So saying, well, could it make sense to go even further uh, and of course, that has to be weight, weight dependent on how much we are with district heating. And you can see here there's actually quite a clear uh, cutoff point, you can say, in, in Austria, which is a bit unusual for many other uh, scenarios. We see a bit more of a specific points where they might be interesting, but in Austria, there's quite a clear point, it seems like. Um, the results are not that different uh, going from zero to around 60% of courage with district heating. Uh, the optimal is around 40%, it seems like, based on our numbers and calculations, 40-50%. Um, and then with the energy savings, uh, we can see that maybe up to 10% extra compared to the original 21%. That's already uh, planned in the baseline scenario, which is based on the current policy, uh, or at that time, current policy uh, put, uh, uh, goals for energy savings. So we could see a bit more here, uh, around 10% more. The difference is not extreme, you can say, but we also have to remember here that we're only looking at the heating sector here. We're not looking at what effect, uh, we're not uh, looking, uh, not making changes to the transport sector and stuff like that. And that is actually is a huge chunk of the total energy system cost here. So minor differences actually could be quite significant within that sector. Next slide, please. So here we can see on the very left, uh, the offering case, uh, where we can see the baseline reduction 21%, uh, around 21% compared to today. And today is around 2015, where we have the baseline, the, the base case for, the reference here for. And we can see that potentially 31% reduction compared to today could actually be uh, feasible uh, economic from a socioeconomic perspective. But it also is the largest investment we have in these scenarios uh, when we look into the future. It is around 6.4 billion annually, so it's a, it's a heavy investment. Uh, but this is total, is not additional. Um, but you can see here also that it varies a lot from country to country how much any savings we could see. Uh, we can identify uh, for most countries, we do find that the, all countries do find that a bit ex that extra energy savings compared to the policies would re be recommendable from a, any uh, some, from a socioeconomic uh, point of view. Um, but 10% points is quite substantial in an Austrian case, but it's not the, the largest extra, you can say. And next slide, please. So here we can also see what the total supply, uh, percent of heat demand supplied by district heating we could see going on. Uh, you can again see Austria on the very left, and on the very right, you can see all the uh, heat room of Europe numbers. Uh, so that is all of Europe, uh, heat room of Europe countries. Uh, and you can see here, we go from around these uh, 24% uh, district heating uh, in the current uh, situation, uh, uh, and then to around 40%, we could see. But in principle, as also showed with the results, it, it is actually not necessarily 40%. It, it could vary. 
Uh, and that is what the, the range shows, is that there's actually quite a, a large rainfall Austria um, compared to the results here. But around 40% would probably be the, the suitable amount, uh, but less could also be the case here. Uh, and you can see that in all uh, Europe numbers, we go from around 12% and we suggest that we could potentially go up to 45 uh, and even more uh, of district heating coverage globally uh, in Hemoglobin countries. But that is very, as you can also see, very dependent on the country. And in Austria, it's, it's not that much more comparable at least. Next slide. And as I said, we do this as an energy system analysis. So that means that we include all sectors in here. I'll just show, um, because there's a lot of numbers we can go into in, in 10 minutes. It's a short time for three-year uh, project with so many partners. So, but here I just show the district heating production we found in Austria. You can see here the baseline 2050 scenarios on the very left. And then we have one we call the conventional decarbonization scenario, which has been set up by European Commission. And you can see here, we then use that, we then use that scenario and then we, uh, look a bit more into the heating and cooling demands, and that's where we get this heat movement bureau study results scenario we can see on the, the, the right here. And here you can see we suggest actually quite a lot of uh, heat pumps comparable to the com uh, conventional one, which uses a lot of fuel boilers. And the reason, of course, is that we want to see a much more integrated system. We want to see that, that we can use uh, electricity from wind power and PV to a lodge. We are much more, much more efficient, and their heat pumps is a very uh, useful solution uh, in this case. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, excess heat from the CHP units, and that, of course, is not uh, fossil-based CHP. It is uh, renewable-based CHP, so it's biomass and some renewable gases and stuff like that. Um, which also made a huge chunk. Uh, we've made some sensitivity analysis and we've removed this CHP. Basically, we just have some condensing uh, power station operation operating instead, um, but it won't make a big difference in how much uh, we can see potentially for district heating in Austria. It will re reduce the potential a bit, um, but overall, that doesn't really affect the numbers as much. It does affect the overall energy system cost, though. So the system will be more expensive from a whole energy system point of view, if we do not utilize this excess heat uh, that we produce on the power stations. And you can also see we have some fuel production uh, heat recovery, and then of course we start to produce some renewable fuels, um, and that is a bit more complicated when we talk about that, but we, that produces quite a substantial amount of excess heat that we can then utilize, of course, in district heating system. Uh, and the district heating systems actually enable us to utilize that because we need it for decarbonization of all sectors, this uh, fuel production. And we also have uh, some industrial excess heat, which is not the largest chunk here. Um, and we also have investigated geothermal, but we do have a fairly conservative assumption of geothermal. So that could be more, but we don't see it as a large potential in Austria uh, specifically. I should also say all these numbers, all these data is based on third generation district heating. So there will be different numbers, of course, which you imply the fourth generation district heating that we talked about earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you see the individual heating production uh, in Austria. And again, you can see the three scenarios. Uh, and you can see here in Heat Bureau, we suggest going to a lot of heat pumps. Uh, basically, all going as much as possible going to heat pumps. And of course, again, the reason is the same as before. We want to utilize the energy as efficiently as possible. Um, but we also want to have this coupling between energy sectors, which we could see could benefit quite a lot, not just for the heating sector, but actually for the overall energy system as such. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the CO2 emissions, because as I said, this was the goal, the carbonization. And you can see here, we could find uh, for Austria quite a substantial reduction from this round, uh, 80 megatons. Uh, a year to around 12, 15, 14, 15 uh, megatons per year, uh, which is, of course, showing for us it's mostly interesting to see it compared to the conventional one because that was what we want to check up on. And that is that when you do look into the cooling and heating sector a lot more, you can actually find a lot more decarbonization uh, than you could otherwise if you would simply just have a simpler, simplified approach to it. Next slide, please. And we can also see that when we do this, we actually do it cheaper than the conventional decarbonization. Um, 
but of course it's in, it will be in this case it will be more expensive uh, than the 2015 and of course this is extremely dependent on what kind of assumption we have for fuel uh, but especially also for what consumptions we have for investment costs and what discount rates and stuff like that so that is uh, can vary to some extent yeah yeah next slide thank you very much uh, if you want more information i would recommend you go into the homepage and find all the results there you can also find a report specifically for austria thank you very much Perfect, Peter. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, I would suggest, since we have a second presentation now from Lukas Kanzler from Kyogena on a similar topic, to have uh, questions on these scenarios and how to maybe we can even discuss a bit how to compare these scenarios uh, after the second presentation. Uh, so we skip questions now and now go to directly to to Lukas. Uh, Lukas Kanzler from Kyogena Energy Economic Group. Um, discuss a uh, similar or a uh, let's say an alternative scenario for decommunization the Austrian space heating sector uh, for 2050. Lucas, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So then. Okay, great. So uh, first of all, Ralph, thanks uh, for the opportunity to share some results and ideas with you, uh, which we gained in this project uh, carried out for the renewable energy uh, umbrella uh, organization in Austria. And the target was to develop a scenario uh, for full decarbonization of the Austrian space heating sector until 2050. Next slide, please. Uh, so, what uh, was the, the overarching question was, uh, what are requirements and implications of a heat transition towards 100% renewable supply of the space heating and hot water demand in Austria? And of course, there is a full bunch of related questions associated uh, with it. Uh, so, for example, what is the feasible path for achieving the decarbonization, which heating system replacement rates and investments are required, which billing renovation rates and related investments are required, which reduction of space heating demand is feasible and required, uh, what are implications on, on costs, what is the role of different renewable heating systems, of heat pump sector coupling district heating, and what about the overall economics. And finally also, what does it mean for the policy framework, which policy instruments are recommend, recommended and required to achieve this scenario. I will pick out only a few of these questions and a few of these considerations for, um, um, for, for the next few minutes. Next slide, please. Uh, and before going to the results, I start immediately with the uh, key messages. So what, what uh, were the key messages of this pro uh, project, of this study? First, we could show, yes, a heat transition with very strong decarbonization until 2050 is feasible. That also depends on several factors. First, we need to overcome the high inertia in the stock of heating systems and in the stock of buildings. So that's one of the, the key challenges. Second, of course, we cannot look only on the uh, building sector. We need uh, this integrated view on the building sector and the electricity and the district heating sector, which all have to be decarbonized simultaneously. And uh, in, in a crucial question also, um, in our scenario, we still have a low remaining gas demand and to which extent can this be covered by renewable green gas and for example uh, and then in particular also what will be the costs for covering these uh, this gas demand by renewable gas of course different regions face different challenges urban versus rural regions and so on we showed several results in our in our report. Um, third, renewable heating systems are usually very close to economic competitiveness with fossil heating systems, in particular under the conditions that we um, uh, applied and considered in this uh, project. Um, next, uh, of course, the heat transition requires higher investments in building retrofitting and renewable heating, but leads to substantially lower running costs for the sector, I think that's what we already also have seen from the Heat Roadmap Europe results. Um, next, a sector coupling of electricity and heat sector is a core component of the heat transition, will be very important and requires certain provisions and measures to really work. Um, and finally, this is a scenario which will not happen just on its own. Uh, we will need a 
broad package of policy instruments, uh, an ambitious policy, uh, ambitious policy framework to make this transition scenario happen. Next slide, please. We applied uh, our uh, building stock model invert EE lab, which has as a um, core part the building stock database, a disaggregated description of the building stock. And we model uh, first for each building segment the required um, in energy need and, and funnel and delivered energy demand and determine the share of buildings and building components which need to be replaced or which need a, uh, some form of reinvestment. And for this share in every year and every simulation period, we determine the, the decision module. Please. Uh, click once or two times and, and the results of every year will, is written back to the building stock database and this forms then or develops uh, or leads then to the to the um, um, results the annual path towards 2050. So uh, this was just a very brief introduction into the method. I will not go into more details. Next slide please. So what were our key assumptions of this heat transition scenario? What is behind uh, the results that you uh, will see in the, in the next few slides? First, the scenario is embedded in a European development towards a strong decarbonization of the whole economy. This means a, a corresponding CO2 tax and or price on fossil emissions. The CO2 tax in this scenario is assumed to increase to 250 euro per tons on CO2 in 2050, uh, starting from a moderate uh, level right now. Um, and we really assume that there is a poly, an, 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 an active policy framework, let's say. Uh, we also assume growing requirements and, and regulatory schemes for uh, regarding the share of renewables as we already have it in nearly zero energy building st uh, standards and, uh, and, and similar and also an obligation for an energetic retrofitting. Um, and this also, of course, means a gradual phase out of oil and uh, of gas, oil and coal uh, in the next years. Next slide, please. Um, and now coming to the first part of the key messages uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, what does it mean in conc uh, concrete for the share of different heating uh, uh, systems of different energy carriers? Next slide, please. So in our scenario, um, we... Uh, uh, so sorry for some reason the the, the axis on uh, the, the y-axis is not really shown. So uh, the, the top on the top, it would be 100 terawatt hours. So, um, but the key message is um, that uh, we, we have seen an increase in the space heating and hot water demand um, from 1994 to 2015. Uh, but in the last years, it already was more or less stable and uh, or even declined slowly and with the corresponding policy framework in place and assuming the, the, the ambitious renovation measures and efficient new building standards, uh, it uh, would be feasible and, and, uh, and also required to our uh, mind uh, to reduce the final energy demand by about 50%. Um, uh, regarding the different energy carriers, we see this phase out of oil and coal uh, around mid uh, 2030s. And it's very hard to completely phase out natural gas because of different restrictions in the building stock. So uh, we think it will be, um, it will probably be the case that there will be a small remaining part or, or at least a small remaining part of natural of, of gas of gas left in the building sector and uh, according to um, other studies dealing with the potential of the biomethane this could be covered by green gas um, we see a uh, a decline of direct electricity systems and uh, on the other hand this increase of heat pumps we see the the increase of solar we see uh, a, a, in 
absolute terms, a small, a slight decrease of district heating. In relative terms, it still means an increase in the share of uh, district heating on, on, the, on the supplied floor area and the supplied number of dwellings. Um, and we see also this slight decrease of biomass um, uh, in this scenario. Uh, and finally, it, it can be shown that also considering the, the natural, uh, reno, um, let's say, replacement rates in the systems, a full reliance on renewables is feasible in the end. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slide shows now the similar picture as before, but not uh, for final energy demand, but for conditioned gross floor area. And we see that a uh, high share is covered by heat pumps, but we also have a remaining smaller share of gas, a growing share of district heating, and a slightly growing share of biomass as well. Um, the heat pumps it, it show a higher share of floor area compared to the share of final energy demand, which means that they are mainly installed in buildings with low specific energy needs or higher energy performance and thus achieving higher COPs. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, the result, of course, is that a fossil primary energy phases out completely, but is also replaced uh, by re renewable primary energy, in particular, also to some extent, by a small share of uh, gr green gas, biomethane, hydrogen, whatever. Next slide, please. Um, a few words about this, this topic of sector coupling of electricity and heat sector and the role of heat pumps. We had a longer chapter and, and some more considerations on this as well. I took only uh, on the next slide, please, uh, the, 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 key, the key elements, the key conclusions of this part. Um, next slide. Please, yeah. So, uh, what we what we concluded of, of our of our analysis regarding the role of heat pumps in the heat transition scenario is that both on the individual side, but also on the on the on the district heating part, and I think that's also a similarity with uh, with the heat roadmap Europe analysis. Heat pumps will deliver a significant contribution to the decarbonization. But there are some preconditions. It only works if we have, of course, the simultaneous decarbonization of the electricity supply, which is quite clear, I guess. Uh, but also the restricting the use of heat pumps for those cases where we see the lowest supply temperature levels. And this, I think, will be a challenge both in this district heating sector, but also um, in the individual heating system uh, sector. Um, next point is that um, in our scenario, despite of this growing share of heat pumps, we can even achieve a slight reduction or maybe stable development of electricity demand in the building sector for space heating and hot water. And the reason is mainly that we have this relatively high share of direct electric heating in the, as a starting uh, in, in the starting point and by replacing this by other heating systems and gradually increase the use of heat pumps um, in this scenario at least it could be possible to keep the electricity um, demand stable and it also shows that there are large flexibility potentials for reducing peak loads which can be used for integrating volatile renewable electricity in the building sector um, but of course also requires the corresponding infrastructure and might be easier in the district heating sector uh, than in the individual heating sector. Next slide, please. Um, overall, I, I think we all do not yet know how decarbonization will look and can look. And there are for sure different options for, first of all, we have this question mark what is the required and, and reasonable and most economic level of efficiency um, reduction? Um, uh, we have seen two different um, um, uh, views also a little bit on uh, these different uh, two different presentations. And also the role of direct decentral renewable heat sources, electrification, e-fuels, hydrogen, e-gases, uh, in the particular also of district heating, um, uh, can be quite different. And uh, we are currently also um, uh, analyzing these questions in an ongoing project for the European Commission, Renewable Space Heating under the Revised Renewable Energy Directive, where we will derive focus scenarios for a 
stronger focus on direct decentralized renewable heat sources, stronger focus on electrification, stronger focus on e-gases, stronger focus on district heating and compare these focus scenarios and see what does it mean and how can the decarbonization of the European heating sector work. So thanks, that's it from my side. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Lucas, for, for that insight into these projects. Um, 10 past two, still we have 20 minutes. We're a bit over. Still, I would like to open the floor for some discussions uh, between these two scenarios. You already had one uh, question in the chat window that was more regarded to the Heat Roadmap Europe presentation from Peter. Um, if the results would be changed when using more updated data, since the baseline is uh, 2015 data nodes, it's five years have been gone. Um, so Peter, maybe you have some, maybe you can maybe answer this question and I would also like to have uh, one or two questions to the two of you. Sure. Um, generally speaking, I'm not sure that will make a big difference. Um, I do have, because a lot of these data, of course, is built on building stock and the building data there. Uh, so that would not change a lot in five years, but of course it could change. Uh, I actually don't know specifically for Austria, but um, I wouldn't expect it to be a major difference in the overall conclusions. The numbers and the nitty gritty, that, that could change certainly. Um, but the overall conclusions that we should have to have more district heating, I'm not sure if we should have that. Are we going to track okay. about that? I, that is a good question. That is, we don't know. There is actually, ah, oh, okay. Uh, uh, looking at both scenarios, I see that it's like the share of heat pumps, share of solar thermal energy, share of waste heat. There's a different, um, different, uh, yeah, different things or different results here. Maybe Peter, starting with you, you're already online. How would you differentiate your methodology and the one from TU Vienna? Uh, why, why do you see different results coming up? I'm sorry, did you ask me? Yes, Peter. Um, well, there could be. I mean, now it is a very short presentation, of course, it will be down to the differences in the result approaches. Um, I was a bit unsure how much uh, information on the building stock was involved and how that uh, was correlated and utilized. Um, but one of the differences, of course, here could be uh, also that you worked specifically with Austrian data. Uh, and we had some European data we used, and that of course is a difference in, in scale. Mm. Good point, Lucas. From if, your point of view, I, if don't I maybe know. may also. Into, I, I think one uh, from my point of view, one difference is also in the in the methods applied, and in that sense also with the type of conclusions that can be drawn and 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 has had to be drawn because i as i understood you apply a, an optimization tool and we apply a, a simulation tool with what we call myopic optimization uh so i i think uh so so this this is a different perspective and we had a stronger focus on let's say how can this path really be achieved gradually from from the status quo until 2050 uh, and, and what are the implications for this pathway uh, but we're not focusing at least in this in this uh, project not focusing on this optimal mix and and i think the strength of your method is clearly this, this optimal mix but on the other hand maybe not so much focusing on on this gradual evolution if if I, I don't know if you agree on, on this. No, no, it makes, it makes sense to me. I mean, we, we go a lot into the 2050 scenario and then we, we stay in the 2050, you can say. We don't really look into the um, transition of it, mm. uh, where you seem to be more transition focused here and you are uh, with different results in different years. And we only have 2050 where we then try and, and understand it there. Uh, and of course, there is also some uncertainty related when we look into 2050, because we do assume that there's a similar building stock and disbursement of the building stock in the 2050 scenario compared to, to 2015, where we have the data for. So it's basically then, then the uh, heat work maybe uses more top-down approach and uh, uh, to Vienna more bottom-up a bit. That, is that something we can agree on? Uh, the, then it's a very broad definition of top-down. Um, <laughs> 
Um, for me, top down is much more where you have a, a, a microeconomic model uh, that then defines things, and that 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 is not the case here. In okay. Our model. Perfect. Thanks. I, I would really love to keep on discussing, but there's still one big program point in front of us. I'm going to be short and I hope we have the time to keep on these discussions. Actually, a small outlook um, in um, um, September, we have the DHC Symposium in, in Nottingham, where we will have a special session on the TS3, hopefully again. So maybe we have chances to and we, uh, yeah, maybe we have chances to discuss these points and similar points then in person directly. There's a bit more time. Now I was trying to give this webinar a bit more um, highlights and not going too much into the detail. That is always difficult in a, in a webinar setting. Um, no, thanks again, Peter and, and Lucas, for the, the both of you for, for giving these scenarios. It would be really interesting to, to compare them a bit more in detail. Maybe we have a chance to do that in the, in the future. Now, it's my turn again. I'm going to uh, briefly go uh, over the um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of this repeating cooling network within an integrated energy systems. As I said, we are we are um, uh, working in the annex uh, IADC annex tier three. It's an international working group um, where we work on different people from different countries work on a hybrid energy networks on different levels. And in this case, we did the SWOT assessment uh, in a shared SWOT assessment. Um, so, and also actually I'm very happy that IEA ESCAN, so the smart grids people, Annex 6, were contributing as well. And you see a lot of names here that have contributed specifically to this SWOT assessment. Um, first of all, I would like to give you some examples. What is a hybrid network, hybrid energy network in my point of view? Obviously, you see on the right top point the different coupling points, CHPs, power to heat, power to uh, gas heat pumps, electric boilers, for me, are, are the main coupling points when it comes to hybridization of this, from a district heating point of view. And you see, uh, and I don't want to go to these examples, we don't have time, but this is uh, certain various examples what could be uh, named a hybrid energy network. And you see a wide variety of, of scales and technologies. You can even combine a couple of these technologies, a couple of these examples to a hybrid network. Um, and so the question was, and that came to me a lot since I'm leading this working group on hybrid energy network. What what is now? How do you characterize a hybrid energy network? What is it? So I came up now with a definition, and you are the first actually that sees that on, on public. That's still a draft definition. Um, uh, so um, the idea here is to separate into three different layers, um, starting with the technology layer, looking at the density and diversity of coupling points and the flexibility the system has, the controls. Um, we can see a minimum system integration if you have, for example, only one coupling point, like a big CHP, that is a, already an integrated energy system that integrates electricity, district heating and gas sector, but it's a, quite a, it's a minimum um, minimum system level integration or technology integration, since that's the minimum requirement for coupling up to the system, so one coupling point. If you go for maximum, you see more and diverse coupling points with more advanced controls, considering both electricity and heating systems. Um, on the strategic layer, we are looking at the integration of renewables and uh, transformation strategies, decommunization and planning. Again, minimum uh, system integration on a strategic point of view would be basically a reaction to short-term market pressures. So you have to, you see uh, CHP is working badly, so you install a heat pump since electricity prices are changing. The maximum level of system integration would be a forward-looking planning and design of the energy system, going to decentralized structures, going more to the optimization. The organization layer, the third layer, is how you do it, business models, services offers, and again, a minimum, level of system integration would be the minimum allowed ownership of coupling points. We have unbundling in, in many reasons, so at least in Europe, we have unbundling from between electricity production and, and distribution, transmission, and these things obviously have to be a split ownership, and that's the minimum we can we have here. But if you go to the, if you have a higher system, level of system integration, you can look at other ownership uh, of, of network assets, you can have uh, ownership of third parties that own coupling points maybe, that own heat pumps or CHPs. Um, you look at innovative business models, new services offered. 
This is a kind of a draft definition. We come a bit back to this definition in the online voting. Uh, so keep it in mind what, what is in written here, but I will uh, we, I kind of remove that now not to, to avoid that you're biased. Um, now looking at this different level, uh, I, not necessarily a maximum integrated energy system is the best one. Eh? This doesn't mean that the minimum system is a, the worst one and the maximum system is, is the best one. It doesn't necessarily mean um, since there's a lot of complexity coming with it and, and uh, costs, you have to invest a lot in coupling points and stuff. So cost efficiency and, and uh, system efficiency doesn't necessarily correlate with the level of system integration. So for looking into these things in more detail, we took the cooperation between the IEA ESCAN Annex 6 um, to create a first SWOT assessment. And that's what I'm now presenting. The review process of that SWOT is still ongoing and actually you're part now of the review process. We'll talk a bit on this later. First, the first focus of integration between district heating and cooling and the electricity net. No, first results again, a draft. So um, I'm happy to take your comments and later in the online voting for changing or amending, uh, improving the draft. Now, so we'll go not so much into the detail yet since I will keep you a bit open-minded for putting in your own ideas here. Um, so starting with the strengths of the, energy, of the coupled energy system, we see uh, higher degrees of freedom for designing and operating. We can use cost-efficient technologies, um, like heat pumps uh, compared to batteries, for example, so power to gas processes. Um, hydrogen burned in a CHP process has a higher energy system efficiency than hydrogen burned for heating purposes only. Um, this flexibility obviously is increasing. We can uh, produce electricity produced locally directly in the district heating network and react on fluctuating energy market prices. Um, and if you use distributed units like uh, storages and power heat units, the system resilience will be increased towards its external disturbances. The second strength uh, section uh, is the electricity point of view. We see that network extension can be reduced. We reduce investment into alternative storages, power line extensions, uh, grid losses are reduced. Um, frequency regulation we can improve and uh, or, yeah, reduce also grid constraints for connecting a new uh, PV installations, for example. Third uh, section or third slide on strength is the district heating network point of view. Uh, by using renewable electricity, we can decarbonize the system directly and at the same time increase the supply of security. We, uh, if you use smaller distributed units, you have lower backup requirements. They can also support low temperature district heating networks by boosting locally the temperature level. And if you go to cooling, uh, the peak photovoltaic supply has a good match with the uh, maximum cooling demand in, in summer times, for example. I'm going to the weaknesses of a coupled system, a highly integrated system, as, as more you integrate it, as more it is complex. That is goes with optimization parameters, the demand side flexibility that is difficult to steer, the stakeholders that have to be involved. There's a little experience in doing this highly integrated system. There's a little products available. We might have interoperability challenges. Uh, there is you need to include more sensors, more uh, ideas how to allocate costs and benefits, and uh, depending on the system design. Each individual energy system should work independently in case the other one has a big disturbance. A second uh, weakness uh, slide is the competition. Uh, power to heat processes, heat pumps are competitor to, for example, um, waste heat that is directly fed into the district heating network or waste incineration, solar energy, solar thermal. Um, the decommunization uh, with electricity electricity only goes if you have renewable electricity guaranteed and many countries still have a lot of fossil fuels and in in winter times where you have very little pv and wind and, and even hydro um, as you have the high heating demand um, so that actually also can change the electricity market prices um, if you want to integrate heat pumps you need to have a good source otherwise it's very inefficient and the overall energy efficiency is, is quite reduced um, third slide on the weaknesses. Uh, if you want to install a hybrid energy district heating network, you need a district heating and maybe cooling infrastructure that unfortunately is not available everywhere. 
or it requires a lot of retrofitting and has high temperature levels. Um, the overall system might have a higher capex for investing into more coupling points if you cannot balance with reduced investments from, from other, from, from more efficient planning point of view. Economics of hybrid energy networks are very site specific. There's no one size fits all solution. We have regulatory restrictions for accessing the flexibility of the heating sector. And the markets currently does not take uh, the local needs into account, yes, or may, mainly the national markets at the moment and, and with constraint, local demand is not considered. Um, that is makes it a bit more difficult to implement these, or to uh, implement the strength or to use the strengths of the hybrid networks. Uh, opportunities, so external factors that might support the development of hybrid energy networks are obviously growing shares of photovoltaics and wind leading to more incentives for flexibility, supporting sector integration. Uh, similar for district heating, district heating and cooling, if you really want to decarbonize your energy system, you need to anyway lower your network temperatures, increase the storage capacity and allow bi-direction structures. And this is very good also for heat pump integration and electric boilers. Uh, general decarbonization incentives like CO2 taxes are supporting as well. And we might see upcoming regulation Energy community from the electricity sector, like energy communities, that are going to support this as well. Second slide on the opportunities: um, we see green financing options and civic and interest in civic participation that are supporting these kind of sector coupling and high investment projects. Uh, new business models, new revenue streams, for example, the easy and ancillary services leads to faster amortization time. End users might have more choices and opportunities to participate in the energy system. We see an increasing focus of hybrid energy networks in the research sector in general, but also industry. And now, as I mentioned in the beginning, also on the policy, se policy sector, the European Commission has a new strategy on um, in smart sector integration. They, they put a lot of effort in it. And, and after the summer, we should have a view on the Commission on these issues. We see training education programs upcoming, and not not of number new number of projects uh, integrated, like we've seen in the first block from Eon, that is working very active on these projects. So that is a good opportunity for getting experience and and actually also job opportunities in these things. And finally, opportunity digitalization. Obviously, if you go on the complexity side, digitalization is a natural partner for solving complexity issues. Two slides now on the. Um, uh, the external factors that are uh, um, a barrier for implementation of hybrid energy networks, that is the silo, silo thinking of many actors together with the change in existing value chains, change so other people might earn money than the existing stakeholders, and that is uh, not, not uh, that's a barrier, obviously. Uh, social acceptance, uh, people maybe not so much understand the very high coupled system if you have your heat pump at home, that does heating and domestic hot water and cooling and operate at the electricity market. That might be too much for uh, certain people. And um, an interesting point that has been brought in as well is if you do a central coupling that takes away the power from the individual customer that the commission and many other people are very much pushing towards um, powering the end consumer. Uh, other threats are the high interdependency. So a shock of one domain might affect the other. Uh, obviously, if you go for elect high electrification, we will see high electricity demand. So we need additional supply and transportation infrastructure. Um, as more interdependency we have, as more um, coupling we have, we see multiple gateways for cyber attacks. Uh, and uh, the system is also very much uh, depending on the local conditions. So you have very much local variable, variable cost on the energy side. Final slide here on the SWOT assessment before we go into the voting. Um, we A big threat is the risk of stranded investment in hybrid energy networks due to the uncertainties of, of many key factors such as subsidies, taxes, due to pricing, or, uh, ownership that is allowed um, and, and, participate, and, and possible to participate, participate in specific markets available of network tariffs or like dynamic tariffs that support flexibility services, electricity prices, uh, um, 
average, but also peak prices, um, diffusion of coupling point and competition, competition also to other sources of flexibility, like electric vehicles, uh, competition to other sources of, of heat or heating, like hydrogen, other green gases, and I mentioned that already, availability of sources for the heat pump, that might be now very well, but if you're looking at industrial waste heat, maybe the industry will uh, close down in, in a couple of in the future, so you not do not have these source for your heat pump that and then the sector coupling is is not efficient anymore. Very briefly on these things, again we will distribute the slides. You can have a look into these uh, a bit more in detail, and we also make a, a public consultation afterwards. So we will I will send out to you as well a detailed questionnaire on these uh, different threats and opportunities and strengths and weaknesses that will happen most likely in June, maybe mid-May mid or June, we will start with the public consultation. So you will have the chance to vote on all of these points and to to, to make your comments and and uh, remarks. So we have then over, after the summer a consolidated document and um, also very important to create uh, recommendations based on these things that will then obviously I also support the commission in in doing the evaluation. Now I know we are a bit we are late in time. Um, I'm I'm sorry again for this one. Presentations were very interesting. I don't want to stop them, but I still would like to use a couple of minutes for uh, doing a voting. Um, so as I said, we're using Slido for the voting. Uh, please uh, go to slido.com and use the uh, four-digit key. 40284, uh, then you're able to access the um, questions. Um, and these are the three questions. Uh, I mentioned them in the beginning, but you will see them now again. So I will switch now to the um, uh, Slido um, presentation. And we will be able to see live the questions coming up, starting with the first questions. So multiple answers are possible. So please feel free to just uh, type in whatever you want, what are the key elements, or what you think, what is characteristic for a hybrid energy network from your point of view. What, is, it a, is it a design question? It's what technologies, what kind of um, organization measures, what is from your point of view the most important points, uh, key elements, what makes a hybrid energy network a hybrid energy network. Um, again, multiple answers are possible. Uh, please just type in whatever you want. Uh, I don't see anyone participating now. I hope you are able to to join. If you have any difficulties joining the Slido questionnaire, oh yeah, here it's coming. And it's it's what we see here is the word cloud coming. So the word cloud actually takes the words that are mentioned several times and uh, makes them a larger uh, proportional to the number they have been mentioned. So I see a lot on. Uh, Storage, I see storages, I see efficiency. Coupling obviously is a big thing when you go to hybrid energy networks. Distributed is a good point. Yeah, it's, I, I see that myself as well. As more you go integrated, as more you're going to be a distributed, decentralized system. Um, um, I see a market uh, interaction and integration. Very important, obviously, for, for interacting between the different energy sectors uh, and integration. Decentralized distribution, a very good, um, uh, like uh, uh, word, words, heat pumps is a small part here. Um, synergies between the domains, biogas, we haven't touched so much upon biogas. Solar thermal is something that is already a bit uh, under pressure. Uh, we, we saw that as well in the discussion from, um, in the presentation from Heat World Map Europe. Um, that this solar thermal is a bit not not so much coming up when you think about too much about hybridization. Uh, the same is true for geothermal. Um, if you concentrate too much on electricity and heating, uh, you might tend to forget other sectors or you do not have the data here. Since data for solar thermal and geothermal are not so well available in my point of view, uh, not so easily generated than European uh, electricity sector markets uh, market data. So we have a quite a good participation, 22 uh, uh, people or 23 now have integrated. I, I like the picture as well. Protocol, I see now very much highlighted. Um, uh, so may, may not highlighted that has been named a couple of times. 
heat pumps is coming up as well quite strongly. Very, very nice. Um, I would like to stop these uh, review now. So people are joining. We are a bit over time, if you don't mind. We're going to keep another five minutes for the other two questions um, that are coming in. Um, storage is important. That goes with flexibility a bit that I'm, I'm kind of missing at the moment. But I see storage as, as a, a synonym for flexibility. Multiple decentralized systems. Um, Open is a new point here that's coming up. Open systems, power to heat in general. Oh, that's working well. Okay, very good. I again thanks a lot for your participation. 28 uh, people have voted here. Uh, very good. Um, I think that very much fits as well to the things that we have defined, especially the one, the thing on distribution. I mean, efficiency is a good point. Huh? Efficiency might. Um, might be more highlighted in the definition of of, uh, of of integrated energy systems that you should not forget about efficiency. Um, that is very nice. Perfect. Now I'm going to stop this question and activate the next one. Um, in your point of view, uh, what are the most important strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats of hybrid energy networks? In your view, again, multiple answers are possible. If you type in uh, the letter, like uh, if you want to name strengths, if you could type an S for strengths, and then uh, um, the the word you would like to put in. Yeah, we have a first one that is says efficiency. Uh, that is, uh, I agree. So we can be able to use efficient and uh, technologies. We increase the flexibility. And we energy savings go with efficiency basically. Uh, decarbonization is a big strength. That looks very good. Uh, um, since uh, we don't have so many um, time left over, uh, we could have made four questions for each of these categories, but I'm fine with as well having uh, one question, putting that every in, in one thing. Um, so we have complexity now is coming up as a weakness. Uh, responsiveness, that is, uh, that is, I would say that is a weakness here. I would see that more as a strength, but responsiveness in terms of the, uh, if a shock appears, then it goes to other, um, it, it is given to other sectors as well. In this case, I would see that as a, as a weakness as well. Uh, flexibility is appearing a couple of times. Um, wonderful uh, threat our policies are coming up. Uh, safety I see here as a as a threat that I think that goes with cybersecurity. Right. Uh, I guess that's a weakness. I would see that is getting more cost efficient, uh, more more cost intensive or investment cost intensive. A weakness is the robustness. Okay, that is interesting. Robustness, I would see as a as a strength actually, but it's clearly that we see here complexity as one of the main weaknesses, and flexibility as one of the main main strengths. And actually, actually, flexibility appears a couple of times that are not assigned to the main flexibility uh, point here. Uh, okay. Let's wait. I'm going to wait an, another minute. Um, opportunities, energy sources. I, I, I interpret this one as a new energy sources for the district heating network to, to have more energy supply options and a higher diversity of district heating supply chances. Um, structures, uncertainty, energy sources is one of the most dominating thing as an opportunity. Wonderful um, complexity is appearing twice as well. Uh, flexibility as a as a um, challenge or as a, as a weakness. New players are coming in here uh, as an opportunity. Efficiency, we had this already. Perfect. Um, great. So we are eight minutes over. Let's let's use still. Uh, one um, question. Well, I'm going to use uh, the remaining time for the final question. Um, 
I'm gonna act this, deactivate this one now on uh, the most important measures and, and recommendations. So what would you, in your point of view, what should be changed from the policy side? What kind of regulation you would like to see? Do we need a new market design, some awareness measures? Do we need trainings? Do we need, need better tools, better technologies for improving and accelerating the implementation of hybrid energy networks? Again, multiple answers are possible. Please feel free to just put in what you want. I will be mute for a second since I need to get a power plug. But please start, start already with your uh, um, inputs. Now I'm back. Perfect. We have already 18 answers. Um, sanitization, regulation, but if possible, can you be a bit more specific? What kind of regulation? Tax incentives, we have one. Uh, Long-term planning, I guess that's a big point here. <clears throat> um, energy planning goes with this one. Subsidies and uh, tax incentives, I would put in the same point here. Uh, I see standardization also very much popping up. Uh, regulation, I would like to see what kind of regulations we see is, is necessary to implement it, especially if you have some background from the electric. I mean, heating sector normally is not very much regulated, <clears throat> but if you go on the electricity sector, you see a lot of regulations. And if you have ideas on what regulation is important for 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 the this for, for allowing uh, and improving hybrid energy networks to be built more cost efficient and overall efficient uh, please put them into the window open grids okay i guess that's related to district heating the open grids um i think standardization is coming quite well uh, long-term planning um, funding goes with subsidies, I would say, and tax incentives. Coordination goes with planning. Um, funding, regulations, planning, that's, I see, the most important measures I see here. And standardization uh, popping up as well, very much prominently. Very good. Okay, that's 21 people participate. That's about the number we had for the previous questions. Again, this is basically a small, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, a first draft training, a first test how, how these kind of things work out. Um, again, we will have, you have the opportunity to go a bit more into the detail. When we go for the public consultation, I will definitely send the link to the document and to the, um, to the online form for doing the uh, detailed assessment in a, as soon as we have a debate. Uh, perfect. Um, no closing that poll as well. Thanks a lot for your inputs. We will gonna make an evaluation here and put it also into the um, into the uh, train into the documents. Um, no, just the last point here is. Um, uh, ba -ba -bum. Yeah, the group photo. I would like to go for the group photo. I don't need to my screen for this one. So if you would uh, like we did in the previous um, session, if you would like to turn on your webcam. Oh, I don't, I don't see the webcams at the moment, but I can turn mine on. Okay, I unfortunately I cannot see the screens of webcams. Um, but um, I hope Edmund, are you, yeah, you are still with us. Uh, maybe Edmund, as soon as you see a sufficient number of people on the screen, uh, maybe you can turn on your webcam. Obviously, webcam, um, using the webcam is 
is if you want it's it's, it's uh, open to your own decision um if you don't want to turn on your webcam uh you don't have to i don't know why i cannot see the... okay i'm trying okay uh, I... before i had the option to hmm I'll try. Okay. Perfect. So, so are you taking a photo? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Perfect. Um. So, as I said, it's only twenty-five people that allow that are allowed from go to meeting participate. So, I would suggest if you turn those who are have turned on their webcam successfully should turn off the webcam now so and the other ones that were not able we couldn't see in the first part should turn on uh, their webcam now so we have make a second picture then we can see everybody here um, i hope that works well unfortunately i cannot see it i don't know what why uh, go to meeting doesn't show me the, the screen I'm afraid we will have to try a second time. Okay. So then please still turn on your webcam if you want. I mean, it's not that bad. We I don't have, we'd still have the picture of the first uh, block. There's a couple of new people maybe coming. Um, so if, if it's not working, I don't, it's not so important. We already have a, a group photo from the first block. Um, in parallel, I would like to go already to the um, to the next steps. Um, here we are. So again, as I said already a couple of times, we will make the recording available on YouTube and send out the presentation slide. Uh, in the next week. Um, if you want to join the work of the IEA DHC Annex T3, where all these things are organized, what you have seen today, or most of the things are organized and, and collected, uh, what you have seen today, today um, please contact me. Um, we are in the middle of the working phase, so a lot of things are already ongoing, So, we, but you still might be able to join with a couple of points. And you might also contact your national IEA DHC representative to see if you get even funding for the participation um, because the IEA for the TS task share annexes there's no money no money given from the IEA DHC as such. For the Austrian participants the national representative is Michael Hübner and I'm his alternate so um, you can then actually also talk to me directly um, also for the funding opportunities. Yes that's basically it for my side. Uh, sorry again for going uh, 50 minutes over, but I think that was really helpful to go a bit more to the discussion on the um, uh, slides, on the on the scenarios, and have a good voting. Uh, I really like the results. Um, we'll make everything as I said available. And um, yeah, that's all from my side. Uh, group photo we already had. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Um, looking forward for having even more webinars in the future. I like the format. Uh, quite a lot. It's it's fun. It's a lot of preparation work to make it smoothly working, but uh, yeah, getting training and getting used to it. Um, so maybe we have more webinars, and hopefully we also have the possibility in a couple of months. In in, in I hope in, in fall we have the possibility to meet physically, maybe at the uh, international DHC symposium in Nottingham, um, in UK, or in other uh, opportunities. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for your active participation. Uh, thanks to the presenters for presenting and have a, have a nice day. Goodbye. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.